between in, from 19, 1892 to 1930, what atom is came on, uh, on the table and people had done research. The first one was J.J. Thompson. He did experiments with cathode ray tubes and he found that electrons are emitted. And he was wondering from where the electrons have come. And he had to, he explained it that it must be coming from the atom. And if they're coming from the atom, these electrons must be part of that. And from that one model of first model of atom was proposed, which is later on said that this is Thomson's model. And the model was a plum pudding, plum pudding model. Or for us, we can say it is watermelon model. In watermelon, the edible part is the positive charge inside. And the seeds are the electrons. These electrons are coming out. So if electrons has some parts, it is not indivisible. It becomes a divisible. So this was the first crack in atom. But how long this J.J. Thompson's theory uh, was accepted? Not much. Within seven, eight years, his own student, Rutherford, he did experiments with golden foil. They were bombarded with radium. Radium was, uh, he got it from Marie Curie, and that radium he had used. And what was expected, if atoms are spheres and solid ones, then most of the uh, uh, alpha particles should return back. But it didn't happen. Most of the alpha particles went out, and only few came back. So he said, atom is more or less hollow except the central part. And where there must be mm, positive charge which repel the alpha particles because alpha particles have also positively charged. And with that, another model came into existence which is similar to our solar system. Like sun, that is the nucleus. And all planets around that are the electrons which are rotating. This also was questioned by, again, new person, Niels Bohr. He was very uncomfortable. But how such atom can remain stable, that was his main question. Without going into the details, you, I'll request you to accept this, that such thing is not possible. And because then the electron should get drawn into the nucleus and neutralized. But that doesn't happen for most of the atoms, and that is why where so many elements are there. So that also uh, had a short life, this model also. But this model became very popular for the school text textbooks. And th that is how the model is, uh, atoms are represented. And that also was overcome by Niels Bohr, because then he said some quantum mechanics he brought into it. And uh, there was another proposed model. On that also there were uh, evolution and new model, Schrodinger's model came and further and further it goes. This whole series, what it depicts? It depicts, and all these people are Nobel laureate except Dalton because that time Nobel Prize was not there. And posthumously Nobel Prize is not given. But re re except him, all people had received Nobel Prize. These were very important work. And still they were questioned and improvement took place. That is modernity. Another concept was in the earlier period, along with the known science of that period, people used to invoke supernatural power or go God and so on and so forth. Meta science and science was mixed up earlier. This was not allowed. You might be religious, have your religion in your home. 
not in science. And there were many religious, some scientists were there. And it, it will be interesting for you, if you are have doubt, to search such people. They had done excellent work in science, but they were believers in religion. And so some people have tried to sort of compute when the world will end, etc., as Bible has said. But they had no daring to publish that in their own name. They wrote by some pseudonyms and all that. That is the dominant culture of this period. Okay. After this, I come to the second part of it. This is what atom is. And once this atom is there, uh, of course, that time uh, Rutherford also predicted that in the nucleus there will be some particles which are neutral also. He predicted, but he couldn't find, found it. In 1932, they were discovered. And so this first part of my thing is, I'm closing this because what I wanted to convey is the modern concept of modernity, how it operated in atom. Now in the second part, once the neutrons were discovered, Many people started, many scientists were guessing that if sufficient neutrons could be there, then, uh, and by that time, parallelly, uh, from Marie Curie, then, uh, uh, means some other on radioactivity also work was going on. And this radioactivity, uranium had the, was first, Bacquerel had discovered that it shows radioactivity. Marie Curie had seen that whether in some other element also, whether it is there are radioactivity is there. And she found it in others also, radium, polonium, later on. These are also all Nobel laureates. So these two went, come, came together. Then many, many people could guess that, well, we can make either uh, higher number of uh, higher elements than uranium, higher number, atomic number. And so people were doing experiment. The first experiment done was by Enrico Fermi. He bombarded uranium with neutrons and with this neutron bombardment, he was expecting to have uh, to get elements which are of higher atomic number. But uh, it didn't happen. Means he assumed, like Columbus. Columbus said that he has found India, but actually he has found America. So that way, uh, then many other people were, they repeated the experiments and some, some people in Germany the scientists, they found that it is not new element, higher element, but the well-known elements are there, but only its isotopes are being, getting formed. From where these isotopes and from where these uh, elements have come here, what made it? And so the proposed theory was uranium atom is undergoing a fission like an amoeba goes under fission and produce, produces two amoeba. In the same way, two parts, uranium atom has been bombarded with neutron, neutron entered that, it split slowly like an amoeba, and two nuclei got formed. And this, can you show this uh, first slide? Where there, there are pictures of uranium and neutron. And not only that, it was also realized that this process also emits lot of energy and neutrons, both. And once this was known, what happened is people realized that it can be used to make weapons. And that time, it is the year 1939, that time, the world war had started. That is, Hitler had 
uh, attack Poland when the war had started. So the weapons thing came and Einstein was convinced to write a letter to President Roosevelt to do something otherwise Hitler might get the weapons and the whole world will be drawn into the war which Germany can win. So Einstein being pessimist, he was in dilemma but still he agreed. He wrote the letter and huh, this is the that fission process. The uranium-235 isotope is bombarded with the neutron. It becomes uranium-236, which is unstable. So it splits into two. And these two neutrons, they hit other uranium atoms. And the fission chain can continue that people guessed. And once the chain gets set in, then weapons are not far away. So the letter was written to Roosevelt and the Manhattan Project started. Manhattan Project, the head of the Manhattan Project was not a scientist. He was Leslie Gruz, brigadier, army person. Weapons has to be under army. Government will have its last word. But scientists didn't realize. And on the science side, there was open humor was there. He was the director. But the overall head was Leslie Groves. And then there were the culture in which Manhattan Project got succeeded is a culture which is not uh, good for science development. Secrecy, mandate, there should be, there will be mandate for Manhattan Project. The mandate was to make nuclear weapons before Germany makes. Don't worry about the expenses. Don't worry about employing the people. People, you can employ as many people as you want, as much money as you want. Manhattan Project started. Secrecy was there. Then spying was there on everybody, on our side people and other side people. One Rod Blot, whose speech I had heard in Bombay, he was given Jamnalal Bajaj Award for promoting Gandhian value. And he was also Nobel laureate, but his Nobel Prize is for the peace. He later on worked for, uh, uh, he was the last signatory of that uh, Einstein, Russell Einstein Manifesto for peace after Hiroshima was bombed. But let us come back to this. Rod Blot was employed there. He with other some colleagues, he approached Grudes, saying that now, because the spying has declared that Germany is nowhere near and nowhere uh, Germany is more or less not going to do this. So he approached and said that now close the top uh, this project. He said no. No, it will continue. And so he resigned and after him some other people also resigned. But then they were all tried that for they were spies. That charge was put on them that they are all spies of Russia or Germany or whatever it is. Somehow the charges were put in hurry so they could not withstand that and they were saved. That is a different matter. So this part is over this culture of Manhattan Project, which is not conducive to science, growth of science, set in even till today. Most of the laboratories in the world have certain mandate. Research laboratories, universities are free from it, more or less. But most of the institutes, world over, they have mandate. And mandate has to be followed. Okay, slightly here and there you can go, no doubt. So it is not curiosity driven research, it is the mandate driven culture. That set in. Competition, it grew tremendous with tremendous speed because there was another fact also has happened 
that along with this uh, capitalism also had come because these values have come into culture this what i was discussing first part through curiosity and all that these values were product of discovery of uh, discovery age where columbus and so on and so forth voyages were made so this was from the uh, discovery age to renaissance to french revolution all that from that these new values had come which were there up to the uh, manhattan project manhattan project cleared those values and set in new values values of secrecy for might be for patent because of capitalism or everything under security so because of security so all our science has all these values if you are following mandat super good and manhattan project because it has tremendous efficiency they did it in from 42 to 45 they made one test then two new bombs and which were the even the setting where the bomb should be dropped four cities were selected from japan out of four city on two cities you will drop two bombs and so when the war was about to end that time also these two bombs were used on 6th august and 9th august uh, 1945 on hiroshima and nagasaki and now amongst the historians in my paper i have mentioned the historians have raised the 14 questions answer these questions and then it will be we will accept that this was to end the second world war early that was the american po political position and this is not true that is what the questions reveal so this culture yeah so this culture has set in and now there are how many uh, reactors are there how many nuclear weapons are there and how many people know on uh, when it came whether it came to the newspaper that tpnw was one treaty which has been uh, passed in 19 and it is in force now from 1921 january that all nations should abandon their and that is the appeal but only except the nuclear nine nuclear powers including india pakistan and others except that all, many nations have become members of this so people question that if the weapons states are not member what is the use of that but they are calling the weapon state as rogue states by that definition and i feel bad that india also becomes rogue state then those people who can't solve their problems with discussion how come there they, they they become the head of the nations it's very difficult they they know how to solve the problem through wars and that is against the humanity so this is actually what i wanted to say only thing you show the go ahead for two more slides and then go ahead Uh, they just choose another one which i have omitted this is helped in making hydrogen bomb hydrogen bomb where made do not use they are made and its capacity to kill people is much larger much larger but no reactor using fusion has taken place so for peace that is nuclear power there is no reactor the efforts are going on but it is not there so the this uh, atom for peace plan which was of eisenhower that was a cover atomic energy is a cover because it is costlier they where to deposit the burnt fuel that 
final destination is nobody knows not only that if uh, the reactor when it completes its uh, stipulated uh, age it should be decommissioned after some years but it is very difficult very costly so it is uh, its life is extended and then what happens is something like fukushima there also the reactors were old many at many places there were problems so this is the thing this is for the fusion bomb or hydrogen bomb go next some two two more slides go ahead this 14 questions is there in my paper go ahead this is the number of weapons existing year wise now in this part number of weapons have decreased true for variety of many efforts weapons number of weapons in the world have decreased but they have become more effective more efficient weapons more accurately hitting the target such weapons have come even in pandemic america has spent huge amount in modernization of their weapons so the numbers and last slide these are the reactors around uh, 415 reactors are existing today but some are over age they are not uh, stop producing electricity neither they are decommissioned decommissioning is a difficult process so thanks for listening to me and i will be glad whenever this question hour is there i will try to answer thank you very much thank you sir i think the session is open for discussion okay discussion later okay thank you sir for your valuable insights and sharing your expertise with us so now i request dr t hari narayana organizing secretary issa to present the shawl to dr birthe Yes. Yes, yes. Open now we have got a very distinguished speaker uh, dr velraj so he will be speaking so i will just request them to make introduction to professor velraj so let me introduce dr r velraj vice chancellor anna university and professor institute for energy studies his expertise and specialization are in the areas of thermal energy storage solar energy desalination energy efficient buildings energy auditing and management and fundamental studies of heat transfer and computational fluid dynamics as far as his educational qualification is concerned he has completed his bachelor of engineering mechanical annamalai university masters on energy engineering anna university and phd at anna university A part of his doctoral research was carried out in Solar Institute, uh, Zurich, Germany, for the period of 20 months from 95 to 97 under Dad Fellowship by Germany. He has an administrative experience of more than 14 years in various capacities. His research credentials are spectacular. He has executed 15 sponsored research projects, published more than 20 to 25 research articles in journals of high repute. completed supervision of 37 phd scholars he has scientific citation 10150 with h index of 52 he is associated with various consultancy industrial collaborations and technology transfer 
In fact, he has implemented various green initiatives and other significant contributions to the society. So we will have a talk. <coughs> so time allotted is around 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Respected Vice Chancellor Dr. Peer Muhammad, the organizing committee members, and all delegates who have come for this Congress. I am very happy to address some few thoughts about my sustainable building architecture. The focus is energy, environment, health. Most of the focus is on energy for the benefit of environment. My focus of this presentation will be towards energy which will safeguard this environment. <clears throat> so it is about passive architecture. Yeah, next slide. First, I would like to give few information about this energy. Very recently, the talk about energy and the environment is there in a large way. For our human comfort, we need energy. For human comfort, we started using energy very recently in a large way. We should know at the time of our independence, the total power generation in the country was only 1,500 megawatt. The total power generation in the country itself was 1,500 megawatt. But after 70 years, now it's more than 4 lakh megawatt, several fold. 1,500 in 1947 became now more than 4 lakh megawatt. But still we are in the developing stage. So you should know around 2040 what kind of energy we need, <coughs> what quantum of energy we need. For better lifestyle, we need energy. But when we make energy, when we generate energy, it is possible at the cost of making disorder to the environment. That is law of nature. When you want something, it is possible at the cost of making some disaster. So that uh, we understood very, in the recent years only, we understood the effect of this uh, environment danger. The environment also, I would like to tell some few points. At the time of evolution of the earth, the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere was only 65 ppm, parts per million. The carbon dioxide level is a measure to evaluate the degradation level of the atmosphere. Our planet also you can see. The carbon dioxide level which will indicate the damage we make in the atmosphere. So after several millions of years before this industrialization started around the year 9800, the 65 became 1000, sorry, 65 became 165 ppm. The major industrialization, automobile revolution, use of fossil fuel which were available in the earth over millions of years, we have started using only the last 200 years. Now this 165 ppm became 365 ppm in 2000. In the last 20 years, 22 years, this 365 ppm became 415, 365 to 415 ppm. Every year, an increase of 2.5 to 23 ppm increase is happening in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide level. You should be careful here. Every year, 2.5 ppm. From 415 ppm, it started increasing. Now, now every year, it is increasing. If it reaches 600 ppm, no human being can live in this planet. So, how many years are there, you can assess. So, another uh, 50 to 75 years, if we progress like this. So, but the environmental scientist understood about this requirement. And now, everybody is talking about earlier days, non-conventional sources of energy. Some 30 years ago, we, when we studied some uh, our graduation, we started telling about conventional energy to non-conventional energy. Then over a period, it should be the word has changed to renewable energy. 
then this renewable to sustainable energy. Now we are all talking about sustainable. Sustainability means whatever sources which are sustainable, sustain, the solar energy only is sustainable. So we should use only sustainable sources for, the, for our life comfort. For our life comfort, we need energy. But I told you, all because of use of this large quantity of energy only, we are making the atmosphere disaster. Understood? So, that too, the major population of this world is there in two countries, India and China. 40 percentage of the, more than 40 percentage of the world population is there in India and China. Their economy level has started increasing in the last two, two to three decades. So, still it is another two to three decades, the, the increasing level. You can see how India is progressing. Here you see, okay, before I touch this, the major contribution of energy is mostly in automobile sector, one sector which is using our fossil fuel in a large way. The second sector which consumes large quantity of energy is building. So, I am going to talk about building sector. The major energy in any country, 40 percentage of the energy generated in any country is used for building, cooling or heating. So, that is the next after this automobile requirement, the energy required for building is 40 percentage. If it is a hot country, for cooling you need energy more. Most part of the electricity generated, you will be using for cooling the building. If it is a cold country, you will be using for heating. So, anyway, 40 percentage of the energy is used in building. So, if we make this energy in a conservative way or in a passive way, then you can re reduce this energy consumption. So, that is what my research and I am going to tell about this. So, you, you clearly understood why we need to focus on building sector. It is the second largest sector of energy consume, consuming sector. So, energy if we use it is at the cost of making high disaster to the environment that everyone should know. So, you should, you can see here India, every year the growth of building is 2.7 percentage. That itself shows the economy is very, increasing rate is very high. If the buildings are high in, in a, coming in a large scale means it shows the economic increase. In level. So, India now as of now in the whole world, the Indian economy is go, growing in a fastest way. So, we are, that means what? We are going to contribute maximum danger to the environment. India is going to contribute maximum danger to the environment. All these days we, we have lived, we lived in a sustainable way, but now we also need a lot of life comfort. We want all very good cars and all our rooms should be condi air conditioned in a proper way. So, some 25 years in our university, when I joined in our university, only some, uh, or we, some hardly some BC registrar director, their three rooms only were air conditioned. Now, some 3,000 to 4,000 air conditions are there after in the last 25 years. One more thing, more than 60 percentage of the building which will be in 2040 in this country is going to come in the coming years. More than 60 percentage of the building which will be in 2040 is going to come in the next 20 to 18 years. So, that means how much, what is the growth of this uh, this building construction side, how it is going to happen. So, now we understood the danger, what it will make if it is not constructed in a passive way. If it is not constructed in a passive way, we can, um, what uh, that too, I, if, I don't know how many of you are civil engineers. The civil engineering, olden days our Indian architecture are very good. It's all constructed in a passive way. It's all, if you see our old and temple, very good palaces, if you see, they don't require any heating or cooling system. Without that, one can live because the sun's energy, whatever it's coming till evening 6 o'clock will be absorbed by this building wall, high thermal mass building, high thermal mass building. But our last 50, 50 years, the, our civil engineering revolution, what it took, no, they studied uh, you, uh, many of you, if you are uh, civil engineers or if your friends are civil engineers, you must be knowing civil engineering, they have studied lot of material strength, am I right? Material strength. With their powerful knowledge, they could construct the building thickness from here to this. 
because this building it's this thin wall itself is a capable of capable of withstanding this total building strength that is total weight of the building but you should know the civil engineers they never studied about any thermal subject am i right in the, in the syllabus if you see it, our uh, civil engineers they are not studying any uh, anything about but building is not only strength of the material it is also about how to cool it heat it am i right so our uh, our revolution in civil engineering in the last 50 years what it made finally we co constructed very low thermal mass building even at morning sun rises at 6 o'clock even at immediately after 11 o'clock the sun's energy will enter into the building am i right because of the great contribution of civil engineers am i right what what one thing from this what one can understood this any research i am also a researcher in particular field if we make some research we do not know everything whatever any if any field engineers know is very little whatever we contribute for this field will make damage in the surrounding that is the law of nature now all scientists they know something they can invent something at the cost of making disaster disaster to the another field then they will start working on that and they will make disaster to the another field finally the atmosphere is the sink which will absorb all the sin whatever all the scientists make whatever scientists the sin make will be absorbed by the sink atmosphere is the sink okay the civil engineers revolution gave opportunity to whom opportunity to air conditioned mechanical engineers air conditioning engineers they got very good opportunity and their business economy has gone up like anything am i right the last 20 years the air conditioning engineers there was a large demand for air conditioning engineers but very recently everywhere investment cost is very reasonable but operating cost became very expensive am i right air conditioners then the civil engineers gave opportunity for the mechanical engineers and now these mechanical engineers gave their revolution their powerful air conditioners they installed in the buildings they gave opportunity to energy engineers because operational cost is very high now no? understood you know this there is a very big uh, building where i had i did some consultancy work in the tidal park 1996 they have constructed very big high rise commercial building came in this city chennai city so that uh, that building uh, that building initial investment was 100 crore for the construction of that building in 1996 you know how much electricity uh, bill they are paying as of now every year they are paying 32 crores one building is paying 32 crores their energy demand is that is that is uh, what is that demand for that building alone is some 15000 kva 15 megawatt it's required so now in the last 20 years in the one such uh, road itself old mahabalipuram road it corridor itself some hundred such building came after this building so you know the uh, air conditioning requirement for the buildings located in the old mahabalipuram road itself some hundred into 15 megawatt 1500 megawatt which is 10% to 15 percentage of the tamil nadu electricity consumption am i right one it corridor road the high rise buildings are there 1500 megawatt which is nearly 10 percentage of the tamil nadu energy consumption so you should under why i am telling you should understand the energy intensive in buildings energy that to 60 more than 60 percentage of the building which are going to be in 2040 are going we are going to construct so that is why it is important if we know the importance of this how much damage we are going to make in the environment and also and also what if you are able to protect this and also I, i explained about what this carbon dioxide level increase so whether uh, next two generation can live or three generation can live that is what if we, am i right in this planet whether next two generation can live or three generation so after that if we, but if there is a very fast sustainable action taken in all sectors that is why there is a goal <coughs> sustainable development goals 17 goals 17 goals the whole world is importing about this uh, sustainable development goals if it is properly taken then we can save this planet 
But if the measures is not taken properly, definitely nobody can save this planet. Nobody can there ma maximum two two next generation, two generation or three generation only can live in this planet. Even this corona pandemic, it also one effect of this carbon dioxide increase in the planet. We are so we were starving for oxygen, no? People were starving for oxygen cylinders because we made a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Am I right? That is the this is also one outcome of this increase in carbon dioxide. Many such uh, pandemics are going to happen if this percentage carbon dioxide increases. Before man get extinguished, before all the animals also, before 600, lot of animals, birds will get extinguished in this planet. Okay, now we understood the need for this sustainable buildings. Understood? I got you. I think you got the importance of this uh, requirement. Okay, well, in this context, what small contribution I have made in this in the research in my research field. That's what I that I will. Tell very far. Now you understood the requirement. So you can understand this very easily. So these are the electric, this, but the world is projecting people, they are thinking people will understand in another 10 years, this awareness will come to all our human because we are intelligent people. We are all intelligent. So this awareness will come in a large way to all educated people and we are, we will move towards sustainable uh, resources for our energy generation. That is what I have told. Here I am showing how this renewable contribution will increase in the next few years. Next, till 2040, how this renewable contribution, now it is in 2020, the almost, now we nearly, <coughs> nearly 25 percentage, now we started using renewable energy for our requirement. Tamil Nadu is using more than 40 percentage uh, renewables for our requirement, but as a whole country is using nearly 20, 20 percentage of many ma major developed countries, they started using more than 30 percentage through renewables. They all have taken mandatory measures that by 2040, more than 80 percentage of their energy requirement should come from sustainable sources like solar, wind. Most of the developed nations, they took. But if we, are, if we don't do it because our major population is there in two countries, if when our lifestyle increases without sustainable sources, they also cannot live. Developed country people also cannot live because we all these days they contributed for the CO2 emission. If we go, we are going to contribute CO2 emission, nobody can save this planet. Yes, next slide. Yeah, sustainable architecture reduces the negative impact on the environment and human health, thus improving the performance during the building's life cycle. So, careful consideration is required towards water, energy, building material and solid waste. Waste disposal also, we, we, to, how, to what extent we should recycle that without much contribution to the damage to the environment. If we, if we put all our waste outside, what will happen in the buildings? We are generating a lot of waste. If we put outside what? Any carbon-based material is there and uh, all this uh, food waste, if you put outside or any waste, that will generate uh, methane if it is don't recycle it properly. That methane is 21 times vulnerable than carbon dioxide. That means the waste which are dumping in the landfill, no, if it is not recycled properly, the danger is 21 times than emitting carbon dioxide straight away. So waste also to be recycled properly. So principles of economy of resources, but when we use this all these waste utilization, sustainable sources, then the life become very easy. But only initially we should, we need some awareness and also a lot of investment required towards the side. Then this operational expenditure will become less, no? We have to build a new world, new world with the all sustainability. Then life become, will become very, very easy and smooth. Next slide. Yeah, this is the kind we are, our, our next, uh, in the, in the near future, our future buildings will be like this. Greener environment, the building orientation is very important and the parametric design. When you make the design, all design should be passive construction and material also matters. This building material also, we need to some... So there are three, three things are there. Either if, we all, if the surrounding buildings are very green, then the temperature itself will get reduced. Some water bodies, in the building, whenever you construct a new colony, it should be surrounded by a lot of trees and some water bodies. 
so micro climate you can create micro climate so that the air conditioning requirement will get reduced if it's a totally a city with a lot of buildings the temperature will automatically surrounding temperature will also increase and your air conditioning requirement will increase so you can create some micro climate okay krishan college you have, you have very good zoo and the forest is there some small micro climate is there here but it is not there in the mount road am i right it is not there in the mount road so micro climate you can create and to what extent some material in the building material if you have insulation properly you can prevent the energy entry properly so material also one thing but there are so there are three ways you can live comfortably preventing the external heat entry one thing otherwise with the high thermal mass high thermal mass you can store the energy during the day time and that means very high thermal mass our old architecture where they were very good civil engineers so those kind of building which will store energy at the night time if the temperature is very less that heat also can be used for heating internal heating so that is another some some climatic condition that kind of building structure will give better solution some conditions if it is totally interior from the sea day time it will be very hot night time it will be very cool like delhi jaipur all this desert area what day time it will be very hot night time it will be very cold so if you construct the building with the material which can store large quantity of heat that will be the ultimate solution without the space heating and cooling you can get you can create comfort both in night as well as day time so that is another but if it is totally always hot or always cool then this insulation is required so based on the climatic condition the type of material to be chosen am i right and another thing whatever we are doing is whether it is hot or cool we allow it inside and then with the powerful air conditioner with a lot of energy we will push back to the energy heat to the heat or cool to the our surrounding that is the third way am i right which is best the third way only we are doing now am i right the first and second are very good based on the climatic conditions and the loca location so it is the building and the building construction is highly site specific highly site specific so one one person mostly what happens the engineers they know how to construct the same way whatever they construct in chennai they will try in bangalore and delhi it is not good engineers should know about in which location they are constructing based on that what is the orientation what is the even in the same place if it is north facing house there should be a difference so all these things one should uh, understand and accordingly the building should be constructed so in the coming days the building the should be energy efficient and use of renewable energy and some storage concept that is what my research here after i am going to tell about few things about what i have done towards this passive architecture this energy saving and in the coming days everything is going to be automation am i right in building also totally automation people will not contact other persons in the near future everything we will talk with the machines only am i right that is that is how the world is moving all industry 4.0 when it industry 5.0 when it comes no person will talk with the other person only they will talk with the machines all iot will come okay that we cannot avoid but because people will learn how what are the damage it is going to make with the industry 5.0 after that only they will give opportunity for sustainability afterwards am i right so we are now marching towards industry 5.0 what are all the damage we are going to make for the human we do not know how right now so the kind of damage for the health and everything we, we will know after 10 years after 10 years after that a new technology for, we will give opportunity for new technology so that is now anyway we are going for iot for smart buildings so all these things whatever things we need to have that uh, these are all the sustainable building environment but when we integrate the sustainable building the iot also every moment you should have the sustainability in your mind otherwise there will be a danger whatever development you make all scientists if they understand what is sustainability and if they make some invention it is useful for the society otherwise whatever knowledge they gain with that they try to invent and try to make business means it is a great disaster to the society it is a great disaster to the society yeah next slide
yeah now i am coming to my research if you some 15 minutes i think i can take it some some 15 minutes i think i have spent for introduction because i want to tell more about the now i will go fast whatever i have done uh, in my in my research so my research is on thermal storage i from energy to i did some work in energy then i got interest in energy storage because renewables we are going to we, we understood there is a need to use renewable sources when you use renewable sources why these renewables has not come into this society all our requirement all these years because it is not a continuous source it is all intermittent source intermittent source anything if you get a, anything if you want all the time it should be available then only life will be comfortable right but uh, it will uh, the energy will be available only during the sun is available the night if it is not available we won't prefer but because of this environment danger only now we are going to the right direction but to make it useful solar energy you want to make it for every requirement how it is possible it is possible with the energy storage am right for one thing i should uh, tell for any technology development for any technology development in this world are we going in the right direction or not whether we are making danger to the environment or we are going in a sustainable way whether we are going that whether the technology what you make whether it is happening in the nature directly whatever is happening in the nature is a perfect system so what any development to make what you need to do you should see how naturally happening so human system is also a natural thing it is not a man made machine natural things for any technology whether it is civil mechanical electrical computer science electronics control and instrumentation if i put a stone on somebody immediately this hand is coming no control and instrumentation how perfect it is how perfect it is if you are living in a when a, if you are in a december month if you ride in a bike in delhi city delhi city what will happen this uh, all our skin will become rough emirate what is happening this uh, blood will not allow blood circle that that our system heart will not allow blood to the top skin nerves because otherwise heat loss will be high to avoid heat loss the skin will become rough because blood circulation is not there so much perfect control system is there in our human system for every technology for how this cells are this construction is with small tiny cells the civil engineers cannot make it the heart is a pump which will run for 120 years without any maintenance heart but we are damaging because that is why it is less uh, life otherwise it's, if it is properly no maintenance required but automatically it, but the small pump no engineers can make such a pump which will without maintenance for some 45 years so so all this ultimatum is there now energy storage also we are taking food only some three times or two times am i right but we are able to manage how to use this energy for all our requirement that means we have very good storage system what kind of storage system is there in our human system if you look inward you will get the correct solution but otherwise whatever is available there in the surrounding if you start looking then you will get a half baked solution but then somebody will give better solution later so whatever is available in our human system is the ultimate solution for every technology every technology solution also human system how it stores energy if you start looking you will get ultimate solution you will get ultimate solution okay now i will give some solutions which i have uh, which i did as a research work so now you understood storage is required storage is required for what to use this renewable sources in an efficient way storage is required so there are so many types of storage electric electrochemical storage compressed air energy storage thermal storage super capacitors a lot of things are there are there but every storage when to apply you should know because now 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 also people are marching towards in the wrong direction energy storage means everybody who is what will come to your mind battery storage only will come to your mind am i right but uh, for now this building is uh, this building is cooled by some air conditioning system it is operated with what electricity but if you use you generate electricity from solar now it became very cheap now it becomes you can generate 
electricity for 2 rupees to 3 rupees per unit with the solar. 3 rupees. Now, it is the cheapest form of electricity is what? Solar electricity. But the cost became very high because storage is very expensive. The storage is very expensive. But we are all thinking about what? Electrochemical storage, battery storage, or advancement in that lithium ion battery, metal ion battery. But it's all very expensive. There are many of the resources are not available in our, the basic resources are not available in our country. We need to depend again uh, some of the foreign countries. But I told you 40 percentage of the energy in the buildings is used for what? Building. 40 percentage of the energy generated in the country is used for building. In that, in that 60 percentage is used for building cooling or heating. So, 60 percentage of 40 means 25 percentage of the electricity generated in the country is used for cooling or heating. 60 percentage of 40. 25 percentage is used for building, cooling or heating. So, that means it is used for thermal applications. So, instead of storing the electricity for the operation of the compressor during the night time, you can generate cool energy or heat energy which is when it is sunlight is available and then use store cool energy or heat energy instead of using electrical energy. Am I right? That is the best solution. That, uh, that form of electric thermal solution is very cheap. The form of thermal solution is very cheap. So, you need not bother about electrical energy storage. You can bother about thermal energy storage which is very cheap. So, 25 percentage of the electrical energy storage, it is possible through thermal mode. Like that some 10 percentage of the electrical energy requirement, compressor for this compressing air, you can use compressed store air storage is the solution. Am I right? So, what application based storage is required? But uh, foreign countries who are making lot of electrochemical storage will not teach you this. So, you will for all your requirement, you will depend on what? Electrochemical battery which is very expensive. So, you should understand for thermal application, thermal storage. For compressed air requirement, it should be compressed air storage. So, that is because it is a mechanical application which is static, nothing which is very cheap. Which you can make it very cheap. Okay, this is what I now now, my research, I will go very fast, not I will not, because it is very easily you can understand. So, this uh, thermal, I, my work is all this, uh, my, my research also, I got very good uh, publications, citations and a very good height index because I am uh, working on socially relevant area. So, suddenly, in 1995, I published very good journals. Till 2005, nobody touched my paper. Nobody touched it. My citation was very less. Suddenly, I felt my papers got cited very much because there was a requirement came, people understood about the storage. My topic was storage. 95 to 2010, nobody touched my papers. But suddenly, all my papers got repeated citation because the whole world understood the importance of storage. That is why my, my, I got very good H index. All citations is not because Vail Raj's paper contribution. It is because suddenly, to my luck, my field got importance in the society. My field got very good importance in the society. So, all my papers which were published in the 95, 90, 2000 and all got cited very much in the last 10 years. Last 10 years. Okay, I will finish. So, now my contribution I will tell. Contribution in developing passive storage system. There are three ways you can store passive storage system. So, in the buildings, how you can store energy efficiently, I will tell very short and I will finish my lecture. So, this building civil engineers, they, they made the th material very strength material, st very, very good strength material in the building wall and they reduced the th thickness to very th thin wall. So, it is allowing a, what? This uh, sun's energy to prevent that you can introduce some phase change material. That is what my concept. Introduce some phase change material which will change its phase around 24, 25, 26 based on the external and internal requirement. You can select a very good phase change material and that material can be integrated in the walls so that it will melt and solidify. It will not allow the internal room temperature to go beyond certain level, comfort level. So, that is the easiest way, am I right? Instead of very high thermal mass, now we are going to give different solution. So, phase change material storage is the solution, one of the solution in a passive 
construction passive construction so that how it works and also for the if it is a very large building air conditioning it's all glass buildings glass buildings then you can store this any way you want to use high high capacity that energy intensive compressor you need that energy intensive compressor also you can operate through solar energy and produce cool energy that energy can be stored in a very large thermal storage tanks and then that energy can be used for the during the night time so you can provide a pathway for using solar energy for all building applications am i right either in the wall material you can bring or you can generate using high power high intensive compressor which is operated by solar energy during the sun that is a day time and produce this Uh, cool energy and store it in a large storage tank now all the with this these two concepts you can understand all these uh, things i will go very one by one you go okay these are passive building passive concept now everything you can understand within a few seconds because i have given sufficient introduction next next so this uh, this is uh, the pcm the temperature variation fluctuations will be minimal because if you introduce this pca material the fluctuations will be minimum next slide one the pcm 1 kg the heat storage capacity is 10 fold than the other material several fold than the other materials next 10 to 20 fold next so you can peak shaving these are all the various materials available in the for building construction next slide Yeah, you do it fast. These are all the this PCM material. We can make it macro encapsulation and micro encapsulation. Next slide. Yeah, another five, two, three, three minutes. I have to finish. So encapsul encapsulation is possible in various ways. This PCM material, how and all you can manufacture. Now this this market is having a very good scope. This yeah. Next. These are all the various material. Next slide. this pca material you can make it as a board wall board and keep it as a uh, wall board inside interior you can make with this pcm based material next slide these are the different uh, structural material with the pcm inside next next yeah pcm also can be integrated in different forms next yeah next slide yeah natural cooling with the night air is one concept night time you allow with the high that is with the fan compressor operation is very expensive fan operation is only 1/20th of the energy required for the compressor so using the powerful fan you circulate the night time cool air to the building so that the cool energy will be stored in this phase change material which are kept inside that is night cooling concept that is called night cooling concept next these are all the so we have also done in the experiment one two buildings one with the pcm material other without pcm we got very good effect next slide so these are the this is the material we have chosen next next we have incorporated pcm in this panel and kept on the top what is the effect we are getting next slide okay next slide the, some good effect we got it we got some appreciable effect but still in summer time since the night early morning temperature is also if it is very high the pcm will not come back to its original state then it is a problem that will give a reverse effect so you should select a very correct phase change material to incorporate otherwise the 10 months it will give good effect 2 months it will give a negative effect it will give a because it should have it should get a cycle night time it should come back to the solid state then only it will melt during the uh, day time next slide next slide these are all the how it is affected next slide next slide yeah the like this free cooling this energy this is inserting phase change material in the wall itself otherwise you can have a very big heat exchanger you can allow the night time air through this heat exchanger you can freeze it then day time you can circulate the air through this and get the that kind of that is called the free cooling next yeah this is the concept so here here you should store some pcm and the night time you should allow this air through this way day time this hot air will come through this and this will get cooled this is the free cooling concept next slide so this also we have tried uh, some experiments we have done in our ex college and uh, next slide so this concept next slide so this is the experiment we have done to explain this concept how it works next slide 
So, like this, one active storage system I have also told the solar energy we can use to operate the compressor and we can produce large quantity of cool energy during the daytime. The tidal park I have done one good work, uh, one consultancy work. There I understood how it works. That tidal park they have very good thermal storage system, but still that uh, after that hundred buildings came no. Out of that hundred building, only four or five buildings only introduce this concept. Okay, I will tell this concept. Then I will tell why it has not been introduced. With that I will finish. Okay, this concept is next slide. So next slide. Yeah, they have the 93,000 carpet, thousand meter squared carpet area. They require uh, this much, uh, their consumption is this much. Next slide. Their air conditioning requirement is 53 percentage of the total energy requirement. Next slide. They need 6,000 tons. You know, this for this building, you may require some 15 to 20 tons. Their total requirement is 6,000 tons. 6,000 tons. But they have installed only 3,000 tons. And what they, they did energy management only because night time the energy price is little less. So, for, not for solar energy utilization they have done. They have done it for energy manage, demand side management. So, because air conditioning the maximum requirement will be there only for 2 hours in a day. Right? But if there is no storage system you, your capacity should match with the peak demand. The peak demand is only 6000 tons. But the morning time they require only 1000 ton, 11 o'clock it may be 3000 ton, 4 o'clock, yeah, I will finish in 2-3 minutes, 4 o'clock they may require some uh, 3000 tons and evening they may require 1000 tons only. But if there is no storage system, this uh, they have to make how much capacity? 6000 tons. But intelligently they have made 3000 tons with uh, that uh, requirement is uh, matched with 24,000 ton hour, kilowatt is power, kilowatt hour is energy. Ton is the capacity of air conditioning, ton hour is the energy consumed. So, the ton hour, so next slide. So, they have, instead of 6,000 TR, only 3,000 TR they have. Next slide. They have 24,000 ton hour capacity. 24,000 ton hour means if you are extracting from the storage system from 3,000 tons, it will deliver 8 hours. Understood? The capacity I am telling. If you are able to extract at the rate of 3000 tons, how much, how many hours it can deliver? 8 hours. So, how it is made? Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, they have this kind of storage system in the tidal park. Four such tanks are there. Each tank capacity is 6000 ton, ton hour. So, they have made 24000 ton hour. 24000 ton hour. So, now this is very much useful for solar thermal storage, solar energy conditioning storage system. Next slide. So, this is, this has lot of advantage. Those who started working in this, they, you will understand this. Now, along with now the solar energy promotion, these people will gain a lot in the coming years. Next. So, these are the four storage tank. If you want to see this tidal park, it is there. But uh, out of some hundred such buildings in the OMR, only Two or three intelligent people only have made this kind of storage system. Next slide. Yeah, this is one. Okay, next slide. Okay, this with this I will st uh, stop. But one more. Finally, I will conclude why this uh, technology is not created good awareness among this public. This uh, air conditioning companies will not tell about this technology because if they if they tell about this technology to the consumer, they are six thousand ton. Marketing, market will be reduced to what? Business volume will be reduced to what? 3,000. 6,000 will, their business volume will get reduced by 50%. It is their business ethics to get more business for their company. So, you should know how to make this awareness to be created for the benefit of the society. For the benefit of the society. The business people will not tell the truth. Okay, with this. Thank you very much. Okay, next. Thank you so much, sir, for yes, sharing sir. With this, uh, some significant. Last, last slide is up. Last, uh, you go. Yeah, the, you should go toward the traditional building. Next slide. Yeah, smart city concept. Okay. Now we are in uh, in Anna University. We are constructing one building with all kinds of storage system so that it will be a sustainable building. Solar operated. We are uh, making a building with the sustainable things. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for, uh, I have extended the time for another five minutes. Sorry for that. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, sir, for we sharing some a, significant insights. We heard a very exciting, very interesting lecture from Professor Raj. Thank you very much, sir, for giving us a nice lecture. I'm sorry for it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know. Yes. I now request our Vice Chancellor, Dr. A. P. R. Muhammad, B.S. Abdur Rahman Crescent Institute of Science and Technology, to present the memento and show to our plenary speaker, Dr. R. Velraj, Vice Chancellor, Anna University. No, I request uh, Professor Kar to deliver his talk. So, since time is already running up. So I will finish it before my time. Yes, please, uh, 30 minutes. Uh, okay. uh, good morning. And uh, thanks to the ESA people and the Christian people to have given me this opportunity to talk to you about some of the ideas which we have been trying out for the last 15 years. We have had a very brilliant talk about the buildings. Let us start talking about people who are living in that building. You may have a very smart building, but if the people are sick, what is going to happen? People have to become healthy, and even if they live in a smart building with all energy resources, everything, Maintenance of good health requires certain principles. And I'm a chemist by training, PhD from IIT Kanpur, long, long ago, postdoc and in Cambridge, came back to India, got involved in biological sciences, immunology, human health, and last, um, I retired from JNU in 2011, came back to Bhuvaneswar, and since then I have been working on how to develop sustainable remedial measures which people can practice themselves and develop go better health. I'm not talking about surgery. I'm not talking about very highly specialty medical care. I'm talking about primary health. Can I have my... SK Corp. So I have changed my title for the health of our planet. I'm only talking about health of the planet means the people who live and people are not the only one which are living on the planet. Animals are also living, so I'm not excluding animals. When I talk about health of the planet, I'm talking about the health of the people and the animals and also the insects, the plants, whatever are living must prevent degradation of the environment. We had a brilliant talk on the energy. Next. You see, this is a very interesting triangle where the focal theme of the 45th Congress was decided to have environment, health, and energy. It's a beautiful combination, but you will see that no matter what you do about energy or environment, Everything trickles down to health. Because I, if you ask me, in the morning I get up and I feel not very good, even though I'm living in a beautiful building with all the energy requirements met, my life is not going to be good. So what is the way that we can do it? Next one. I will just digress for about five minutes and then come back to my original work. I am going to talk about my work. Please pardon me for that, because I can tell authoritatively what I have done and how it is going to benefit people. United Nations Development Program creates a list of countries which are developed. And the criteria they use for assessing the developmental index of that country is life expectancy at birth, mean years of schooling, 
gross national per capita income of the citizens of the country. All these three things do not depend upon the building you are living in. What is the quality of your life? And how we can improve it? And something, examination of all the three criteria shows that health plays an important role in determination of our position in that list. And unfortunately, India is 131 out of 189 countries. And this has become one slot lower. In 2018, we were 130. We have gone down to 131. It is not because we are not making effort. But it's a cumulative efforts of everybody. And that is something which I believe me, yesterday, because I was not well, I could not come here. I sat in my room and started reading a little more about it. And the second slide, the third slide, is actually from there. We are faced with a development paradox. People are living longer, healthier, and wealthier lives. Beautiful building, cars, everything. But has not succeeded in increasing people's sense of security even before the uncertainty wrought by the COVID-19. COVID-19 has brought in a lot of anxiety in us, has developed more insecurity among people. And you all know that how unequal you are, you realize on a pandemic condition like this. So next one. It suggests that during the Anthropocene, this is a period, an era, in which humans have become central drivers of planetary changes. You can bring about changes which is positive, or you can bring about changes which is negative. You emit more ox carbon dioxide or methane. You see the cows. You may be very interested to know that cows, when they bleach, they bloat or whatever they they ex uh, produce methane. Those so Americans advised India to kill all your cows. Then uh, methane emission will decrease. Fortunately, our government did not listen to them. We have the largest population of cow in the world, and we produce a large amount of methane through them. Carbon dioxide, of course, any car, any building material, construction activity, and our all uh, manufacturing processes, cement industry, steel industry, consumes a lot of energy, and that produces carbon dioxide. And so we are actually destroying the environment. This is the point which Professor Raj also said, Doctor, before me also was talked about, and but how do we go about it? I will probably skip a couple of slides. Please go ahead. I will tell you where I would like you to stop. Because, you see, I have just picked up from the internet two pictures. And these are pictures not in the imagination of somebody, these are the pictures actually taken how the glaciers are melting. People go there every year six times and take measurements on the basis of which they are saying emerging technology complemented by the availability of satellite imagery allows the scientists to create digital elevation model which shows that the glaciers are melting. And this is an irreversible process. Glaciers are melting means the water will come and God knows what is going to happen. I do not want to imagine what is going to happen in the coastal areas. And this is a map. Let us have the next one. This is something which happened to us in India recently. A disaster related to this type of activity. And it created in Uttarakhand the disaster. Not many people died, of course. But it gave us warning that don't tackle, tickle with me, don't play with me, I will destroy you. But we are not listening. Our developmental activities are not getting changed because of the possibility of this disaster, because we are only interested in the next five years. I hope you mean, I understand what I mean by that. Next five years, after that we will see. They will not see, they will not be there. But our generation, our people will be there. So next. I will not go into detailed discussion of this because I am not capable of doing it, but I have just listed it here. 
there are eight impacts of environmental exploitation. Just quickly go over it. There are eight, chemical safety, air pollution, climate change and natural disasters, diseases caused by microbes. It's very surprising that the climate change creates new microbes, new condition for infection. And I'll be actually a little bit focusing on that because that is the area in which I have worked for almost 40 years. Lack of access to healthcare, infrastructure issues, poor water quality, and global environmental issues. Since time is not very much there, and I want to finish before my time ends at 11 o'clock, let us go quickly. I will tell you where to stop. Just go ahead. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Please go ahead till you reach the eighth one. Because all these things are not necessary to discuss at this stage. But if I am able to make you understand what I am trying to tell you in the next 15 minutes. Next one. Now let us shift our discussion to a disease on which I am working, which arises due to parasite transmitted through mosquitoes, that is malaria. We have not taken malaria very seriously in India particularly. Of course now, because of commercial reasons, institutions and companies are interested in malaria vaccine. We do not have a malaria vaccine yet anywhere in the world. And I have participated in WHO meeting, United States meeting, in many meetings when I was young and was able to travel. My impression is that people are not interested in malaria. Because how many people from outside uh, other than India and Africa are dying in malaria? Very little. But they don't realize that it will revert back. But probably they realize, but that's like our politicians, they think, Are, humko abhi kuch. let us make some money now. We'll see what happens. Malaria is a major issue. And for your information, malaria has been killing one million children. Till recently, one million. It came down a little bit, but again it has started going up for last how many years? 200 years? 200 million people have lost their life because of malaria. And because we do not have a vaccine, and the malaria parasite is very clever. Any drug that you use, if you use a single drug, it will develop resistance. Next one. Here I will just spend one minute, because this is a rather humorous thing. It is an interesting thing. Uh, before I go into this, let me just think how I'm going to present it. In a class when I teach about malaria, I ask the students, tell me how many Indians born in India and worked in India got Nobel Prize? The student will say, sir, I don't know, but I think C.V. Raman. I said, yes, you are right. Professor C.V. Raman, got Nobel Prize by working in India in Association for Cultivation of Science in 1930. And the effect was known as Raman effect. But somebody else got Ronald Ross. Ronald Ross was born in India. And he got worked in India. But of course, he became British citizen later on. But Sir Ronald Ross was the first Nobel laureate, born in India, having worked in India. And please read about his work, my young fellows here. Please read about your work. It will motivate you because he was a doctor, had no support, but he proved that malaria parasite gets transmitted through mosquito. Mosquito bite is responsible for transmission of malaria parasite, and that for that discovery he has got the Nobel Prize. Uh, the interesting story is I read. And if you read, you will also find that article, I don't remember, that Britishers would have left India long ago if they would not have discovered Sinkona tree. What does that mean? Sinkona tree? Malaria? British? The Britishers came from outside. They were not exposed to the malaria parasite because we are born and 
brought up here, we have resistance to malaria, some amount of resistance. So we survived. The British officers started dying um, very in large number. The British government discussed it, said we just quit India and come away. But somebody made a very interesting discovery. In Peru, they found there is a tree called Cincona tree. That bark people used to take and boil and get what is known as tonic water. That tonic water, if they drink, they will not get malaria. So they brought that cinchona tree to India, grew it here. They found that it is not effective. They took it to Java and Sumatra, grew it there, and took the bark from Java and Sumatra and prepared the tonic water. And tonic water was given. That is why at 4 o'clock in the evening, the Britishers developed that drink. A little bit of drink, with, because it is very bitter. Tonic water, you mix it with uh, tonic water, you know, you remember those of who go to a bar and uh, order for tonic water, uh, gin and tonic water, and that has a curative value. Everybody has to drink it because it prevents malaria. And even um, Jim Corbett has written in his book, Man Eaters of Kumain, that unless I have a bottle of Jim Tonic water, I will not venture out because I will drink tonic water every day so that even if mosquitoes bite to me, they will not make malaria infection in me. So tonic water is a very interesting story. But during Second World War, the Germans bombed the ships of British um, ships and destroyed the supply. And therefore, the uh, British people put pressure on R.B. Woodward, Professor R.B. Woodward at Harvard University, that can you synthesize quinine? And in two years, he synthesized quinine. Quinine is the content of the tonic water besides many other molecules. And 1948, it started being distributed and it controlled malaria immediately. So people were happy, government was happy, everybody, we had just become independent. And we thought that we are able to conquer malaria now. But just single use of uh, quinine generated resistance. In about 20 years, the malaria parasite became resistant. There is another plant called Artemisia annua, which grows in China. But now people have started growing it in India in a project, Government of India project I was involved. This has a leaf which has a product called atimicinin. And the Chinese professor who got Nobel Prize for the first time, a lady, in 2002, worked on atimicinin and developed it as an anti-malarial on the basis of the fact that the Chinese had been drinking, uh, drinking tea with atimicinin annual leaves. And that gives protections against malaria. And that is the only medical um, medicament that we have for malaria treatment now. WHO has said that you cannot use it singly. You have to use it in combination with other synthetic drugs because otherwise the parasite will develop resistance. But the parasite has already started developing resistance. In India also, we have now detected resistance against atimicinin. And that is the time in 2006. My journey with curcumin started in 2006 when I was requested by my chief minister, Navin Patnaikji, Honorable Navin Patnaikji, in a meeting with him, he said, Professor Kaur, if you can do something for malaria, I'll be extremely grateful. So I went back and looked at and found that curcumin. You see, curcuma longa, I'm sitting in, I'm standing in Tamil Nadu and talking about curcuma longa. This is the state which produces maximum amount of turmeric or curcuma longa cultivation is going on here. And if this country, this state wants, it can certainly eliminate not only malaria and few other diseases about which I will talk, my own work. So I got interested in curcumin because curcumin is a compound present in turmeric, haldi, about 3%. And we are taking it for generations. And we do not know what is happening to our body, but we know that Grandmothers know that if a child falls down and injures, they will give a paste of turmeric there. If somebody develops, a child develops a fever, grandmother will put a spoon of turmeric into the milk and drink and the child will be all right. 
if, if the children develop tummy upset, because yesterday I had tummy upset, I kept on taking my curcumin, which I brought with me, I became all right. So the thing is that there is a, there is a product, there is a formulation, but what is the scientific basis? If you do not do science, people will not accept it. It is not magic. So what we did, next one. This is just a picture to show you, those of you who are familiar, at the bottom it is showing a picture of turmeric converted by our process to nanocurcumin. Why nanocurcumin? Because then it is bioavailable. Curcumin is not soluble in water. Therefore, even if you put a um, tablespoonful of turmeric or curcumin into your mouth, it is not going to help because you need bioavailable material which can go to the blood and show the efficacy. So we developed this method. And um, again, I will finish. Again, I was a professor at JNU. My vice chancellor, B.B. Bhattacharya, called me and said, Professor Kaur, I understand that you have made nanocurcumin. I have asthma. Can nano, your nanocurcumin, because it is an anti-inflammatory drug, please note that every disease, whether it is COVID-19 now, or it is asthma, or it is tuberculosis, or it is cancer, is a inflammation-related disease. If you control inflammation, you will control that disease. So anything which is anti-inflammatory will control. Like, for example, I was giving a talk to a school uh, children in Bhuvaneshwar, and I was talking that the bats have this parasite. And from bats, it came to human being, and then it is creating all the problem. The child raised his hand and said, sir, why the bat doesn't have the fever? Why does the, does the bat die out of coronavirus infection? It's a very interesting question because the bat knows how to control inflammation and therefore it survives. But whereas human beings are not able to control inflammation caused due to infection with this virus and therefore they die. So we prepared this. Next one. Curcumin is a natural anti-inflammatory compound. Curcumin dramatically increases the antioxidant capacity of the body. If you keep on taking it every day, your antioxidant capacity, the thing oxygen meter that you are measuring, will remain constantly 98. Curcumin boosts brain-derived neurotrophic factor because it crosses into the brain. Therefore, scientifically, it has been acknowledged that in India we have less neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's because we take curcumin. You take a statistical survey, you will find in India the number of people dying out of neurodegenerative diseases is at least 50 times less than the people dying outside. Curcumin may be useful in preventing and treating Alzheimer's disease. Curcumin has incredible benefits against depression. It uh, makes you feel energetic and takes you out of depression. This also we have done. Curcumin can help prevent cancer. So while this was going on, next slide, please. I will just skip this slide to save time because I have to finish in another 10 minutes. No, no, 10 minutes. I said 11. I will finish. I started at 10.40. Uh, Turmeric is not effective because the curcumin is not bioavailable. Next, next slide. How to overcome poor absorption of curcumin? I said that if you convert the curcumin by chemical means and then convert it into a molecule, our drug authorities will not allow it to be given to our people. And even though we have not done, we have not yet been allowed, I will tell you that story later. But we therefore decided that we will not convert curcumin into anything, but physically we will convert it into nanoparticles. Next one. Let's go to the... We have made nanocurcumin by same DLS, next one, same scanning electron microscopic picture we have proved, and this is now patented. Next one, bioavailability is more in human as well as in mice by oral route. Next one, the chemically HVLC profile is same. Next one, then this is the multitop, again same. Next one. When I was doing this, uh, 
I was um, invited by DBT to give a presentation to the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, scientists that what I have done till now, I gave a presentation for 20 minutes. And at the end of 20 minutes, the Deputy Drug Controller of India, who was a Saddarji at that time, came and embraced me. He was a tall man, embraced me tightly and said, Professor Thor, we are proud of you because we want scientists like you to work on our traditional medicine system and prove scientifically how they work. Just take this, it will cure. No, people are going to ask you questions that how does this work? So I gave that lecture. He embraced me, so I said, can I go and meet the drug controller of India? It's a long story, but I'll just, in one minute, half a minute, I'll tell you. My intention was to meet the drug controller of India through the deputy drug controller. I went and met him next day and requested me, him to allow me to use nanocurcumin treating malaria patients in Odisha. He did not allow initially, but finally allowed. We used it, and that was in 2008, and we showed that three days, you can cure malaria. So once we showed that our nanocurcumin is able to cure malaria, plasmodium falciparum, vivax, and mixed infection of plasmodium falciparum, vivax, by just taking three days, two capsules each, parasite, no parasite, no clinical symptom, everything is done. We did not do it. The Vajja did it. One Vajja took it. So we got the courage to go ahead and do further work on that. But what is the further work? When we were here, a cancer patient, a cancer patient case was brought to my notice that Professor Kaur, uh, curcumin has been shown to be very effective on cancer. Would you give your nano curcumin to my father? I said, no, I cannot give. Let us discuss with his doctor. He was being treated in Vedanta Hospital in Bombay, uh, Delhi. And... Um, Naresh Trehan was the director and owner of that hospital. I knew him. The doctor who was treating, I also knew him. So we discussed. They said, okay, go ahead and give it under our supervision. This gentleman was 79 years old. He had brain tumor. He has been irradiated heavily so that he cannot see. He cannot even lift his hand. And our nanocurcumin for the first time was given to a cancer patient. And he became all right in three weeks. And he survived for four years. All the data is there with me. That maybe we are able to cure malaria. We are able to do something, improve the quality of life of cancer patients and make them survive longer. Please note that there is nothing available in the market which can reduce the toxicity of chemotherapeutic agent if you take, take them along with the chemotherapeutic agent. That means it should not interfere with the chemotherapeutic treatment but also reduce inflammation, it does so. So, just again very quickly, we treated. And I said I will not get involved. If a clinician recommends patients to us, we will give, and we have given to roughly listed here, all types of cancer patients at the fourth stage, when the patient has crossed the limit of, when the doctors raise their hand and say that they cannot do anything, at that stage they can be given cow dung or urine or anything, anything. So the doctor prescribed, we gave 30 to 40 percent of them survived longer, had better quality of life. Curcumin induces sleep. Children, those who are having sleep problem before examination, you take curcumin, you will sleep very well because it reduces inflammation. So these people, we showed that it is uh, preventing rapid death. Improving the quality of life, that means they are able to sleep, they have no pain in the body, they are able to digest food. I'm talking about old age people who are suffering from cancer. After chemotherapy, their body is completely damaged, but by taking curcumin, they are able to survive three to four more years in a normal manner. We have given to about 250 cancer patients by now, sitting at Bhuvanesha, prescribed by Dr. Kaur. He's not my relative. Madhvananda Kaur, he's a professor at Ames Bhuvaneshwar. He prescribes, patient comes and purchases it from us. And who cannot purchase, we give them free. And that is what is the result. The 250 cancer patients of all, all types have been given this. And they have shown 30 to 40% of them. You may ask, why only 30 to 40%? 
because it's a typical cancer is a very complicated disease. There's different types of disease at a different stages. So only 30 to 40 percent are showing effect, and that too particular type breast cancer type of disease, oral cancer, beautiful. So we have that data. We have gone ahead with taking taking the tests, making the tests done. Uh, April second week, I'm signing agreement with a company which will be taking it up for um, commercialization. It will be provided to people at a, not a very cheap rate. And that is why I'm here, the last five minutes I'm going to spend in telling you what that I'm interested. No, please don't reduce my time. Then I will stop here. No, I'm not taking more than my time. By 11 o'clock, I'll finish. Okay, three minutes. My student said, sir, one of the major problem of health problem in India is, this is important, sir. Don't take it trivially. One or two more minutes doesn't matter. He said that, sir, if you take the stool examination of our children between 5 to 15 years, 50% 50 of them have worms in their stool. And there is no treatment. Government of India, being influenced by the multinational, has recommended albindazole. In the schools, they are now distributing albindazole, which is a very toxic compound. It, of course, cures, but doesn't protect. So I said that go and talk to the headmaster and the parents, and if they allow, we took it. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. I'm skipping the wound healing part because it was also done. It is healing the wounds of dogs beautifully. Beautifully. And this work was done by OUAT. About 150 dogs with their wounds were treated with our formulation and their treating, their curing. So we are taking animal thoughts. So into consideration, this can be also used for human. We are in talk with people where they will be using it. But let's go to the end. This is the treatment with the previous one. A group of children, 11, initially we thought that may not work. We examined their stool, gave them 15 days nanocostomate, and then examined, and 50 to 80% of the children recovered from worm infestation. And what does the worm do? It sits there in the tummy. These are ascaris. They eat away the protein the mother has given so carefully to the child. They eat away. So the child becomes malnourished. And then they secrete some molecules which crosses the blood-brain barrier and goes and damages the brain. So the children are stunted growth and mental, mentally not developed. So we have shown that that is happening. So basically, my product, we have shown that it works in cancer, works in malaria, works in uh, uh, wound healing, and works for the, uh, the uh, warming of children, 20 crore people are there in this, children are there, 10 crores are suffering from this, and curcumin is a not toxic product, it can be made, and that, the beauty that I want to spend just maybe last two minutes, you all can make it at home, you don't have to make it in the nano, we have done it and it is expensive, so my proposal is that you grow Kurkuma longa plant in your kitchen garden. Take out the, and this is the season when it will be cultivated. Take it out, and I will provide you the process if you contact me without any cost. You prepare the Kurkuma longa extract, and to make it more effective, are ginger. Ginger is another plant which has a beautiful anti. Uh, inflammatory property, and then add a little bit of aloe vera. So all these three combinations if you make, and before you go out to school or go out to work, you just take a quantity every day, you will not suffer. Let me tell you, I am not taking any medicine. I don't get malaria, I don't get any of the diseases that I can guarantee you that 50 to 80 percent of you will not suffer from malaria, will not suffer from dengue, chikungunya, and if you are not suffering from cancer, you will not suffer from cancer. And our latest work with DBT, which is ongoing, it is showing efficacy against tuberculosis. So we have a product which is showing efficacy against malaria. We have a product which can heal the wounds. We, can, we have a product which can cure um, deworm the children. 
and we can also make products which are going to be effective against many other inflammatory diseases. And I am willing, if from Tamil Nadu anybody is interested in cultivating in their land, in fact, I went to Allahabad to chair a session there on People's Council of Education, and somebody who was there, he has gone back and he says that, sir, I will do it. UP, one person has started. Dr. Chobe also is interested. If there are a couple of people from here who will be interested in industry, because, sir, you are having people with you. Call me. I will come by my own money, meet them, convince them that this is the way to help our people. You can control the environment. You can produce solar energy. But if you don't make take the care of health of people, and these are common problems. Children, pregnant women, I did not talk about pregnant women at all. Pregnant women, how many? 29 million pregnancy take place in India. All of them are suffering during pregnancy. And this can be given and prevent certain diseases. Pregnant women, old people like me, and even young people who are working can take this. And this is no rocket science. There is no rocket science. There is no regulatory rules. And thank you very much. So we had very nice and very uh, exciting lecture and information given by Professor Kar. We are thankful to him for very nice lecture. Sorry for cutting your time, sir. <laughs> We are really enjoyed your lecture. I am also making an announcement that if somebody okay. wants to do it, okay. call me, sir. I will talk to him. He prepared this. Now request uh, Professor S.K. Nath to please deliver his talk. President, uh, please uh, introduce the speaker. Oh, you don't have his bad idea. Okay. <laughs> professor S.K. Nath uh, is a senior professor at IIT Karakpur. He works on micro seismicity of different cities. You know, whenever the earthquake takes place, building kills the people, but he does the science of the seismicity. And then it is very useful for people who live in uh, cities. He already covered most of the Indian cities. And he has been received, he has received a SS Bhatnagar Award, a prestigious Bhatnagar Award, some called Indian Nobel Prize. He has received that. He's a fellow of National Academy of Science, Allahabad, and, and fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering. Very prestigious one. Uh, he has put it okay. Very good. And I am really happy to introduce him to Indian Social Science Academy as a fellow. And uh, he's a very good, uh, and he has guided almost 50 PhD students and one of the most prolific writers. And he is also editor of several international journals like Natural Hazard, Seismology, anything with seismology. Indeed, he is one of those very few who knows the science of seismology. The many people does uh, taking photograph of damaged building and damaged people, killed people, and they just a template research they do. But he is not like that. He understands the science of the seismology, and he goes very detailed engineering structures, everything. Most productive scientist. I am very happy to you introduce Professor Shankar Nath. 
to Indian Social Science Academy. Please deliver. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate uh, for uh, Professor Paksisharati for introducing me to the audience, although the audience is very impatient for a cup of tea. And the being a fourth speaker in a row of four speakers is very tough. I remember one of my uh, senior colleague, uh, Dr. Harshgupta, uh, whenever I used to go for any uh, meeting and presentations, he will keep me always at the end. The reason is that people will be trying to go out and I will try to keep them bound, bounded here in the audience. Uh, well, uh, uh, that's what is the fate. That's the destiny. Uh, today morning when I came here, uh, Dr. Chobe told me that my lecture presentation is not there. Then I told him that I'm going to Chennai. I had to Chennai spend some time with my friends and go and have some uh, liquor somewhere. And, uh, you know, with curcumin first so that liquor doesn't hurt my liver. And <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have all sorts of people, you know, in the, in the, the today's presentation. We had a fantastic presentation by VC of Annam. Uh, uh, Anna University, he talked about buildings. I talk about damaging the buildings, the destruction of buildings. And you talk about uh, remedy of uh, the human health. And then somebody, somebody, yeah, you talked about the Nobel Prize and all those stuff. So many things, you know. And the brain is junk. So my friends, Young friends, don't leave the aud leave the auditorium. Otherwise, I will lose the tempo. Uh, by being the last man and being a senior professor in IIT for the last uh, 34 years and with a total industrial experience of about 45 years now, I am already 62 running. So several few several years are left. And I generally do not talk on mic because I don't stay there. I have a habit of going there, explaining there, and things like that. Well, I will be sharing with you my experience of uh, working with earthquake, one of the many uh, one of the many extreme events we have. Earthquake is one of uh, the uh, several of uh, the geohazards like volcanoes, uh, the tsunamis, landslide, and mudslide. In fact, is the landslide and tsunami is being triggered by an earthquake itself. So they are secondary byproduct of earthquake. And also we have the climatic hazard, uh, the floods, the broad hurricane, uh, the cyclones and industrial and other hazards are there also. And as Oscar Wilde uh, once uh, he uh, observed uh, that man can believe the impossible, but man can never believe the improbable. That's what the extreme event is. I will just show you and introduce you to the extreme events which we have. We have extreme events above the earth and they are in the form of extreme cold, storm, cyclones, lightning, frost, drought, excessive rain and hail. And this being a plenary lecture and this is not a research presentation. So I, am, I will be going a little bit here and there. And I would like to, uh, excuse me for that. Uh, had it been a public lecture and a research presentation that for 10 minutes you come and speak something and go, nobody bothers what you talk and who gives a damn to it. You said, this fellow came, presented, bullshit, go. So, but I got an op opportunity, to, op op opportunity to introduce you to be and make your appetite for tea more. So, so we have uh, the extreme events on the earth, of the, on the surface of the earth. Those are coastal erosion, tsunamis, Tsunami is triggered by an earthquake without that in my mind. And then we have the coastal erosion, avalanche, and landslide, and diseases. And clean the earth is the most deadliest of uh, the deadliest of uh, the uh, extreme events that is earthquake and the volcanic eruptions. We have volcanic, volcanogenic earthquakes, we have protonic earthquakes, we have earthquakes coming from uh, submarine avalanches, and so on and so forth. So with this, if we look at only a global scenario of what happened and what are the destruction caused by all the different uh, natural uh, calamities and for uh, the cities, uh, for uh, the continental regions in the earth, which we see the earthquake, uh, the, although it's very infrequent, 
uh, the, the drop of very frequent and the floods are more, but the uh, fertility caused by the earthquakes are nothing less than any one of them and needs uh, special attention and very important attention to this, especially because right now we are sitting on our really is a hot bed where we have earthquakes almost every now and then and not a single space of earth on, in, on earth is earthquake free regime, no more. And the reason is that we are getting more educated, we have higher, more advanced technology, we have sophisticated technology to send each and every one of them and our knowledge domain and our wisdom level is also increasing. Every day we are getting enriched with, with wisdom. We know nonlinear uh, uh, physics more now than the uh, physics, uh, the Newtonian physics that used to be now. So therefore, so with, and if we look at extreme events and, and just for only one year, 2017, we had uh, all over, we have hailstorm, hurricane, and we have earthquakes. There are one, two, three, four earthquakes that have occurred within this. These are the deadliest of the deadliest uh, earthquakes in Japan, uh, Italy, and uh, and of course in Ecuador. And and the one which uh, the, uh, there are some of the deadliest earthquakes. The one of the uh, the most deadliest being the Prince Williamson earthquake of 1964. Uh, now let's come to the Indian condition. What's happening here? India has it suffers. The India has been rocked by all the extreme events, be it climatic like sea level change, and coastal erosion, rocks, floods, and cyclones, and landslides, and of course the tectonic, the earthquakes, and tsunamis. Fifty-eight percent of the land area in India are earthquake zone. Of this, twelve percent are vulnerable to severe earthquakes. But 12% are from to the floods, 8% to cyclones, 25% to landslides, all region, 68% uh, is prone to drought, and 85% are uh, to multi hazards. If you see here, uh, if we have uh, statistics of 1737 to 2014, 22 states of India are suffering from multiple hazards, um, simultaneously almost occurring, and one has happened in my own hometown in Kolkata in 1737. We had uh, the earthquake, uh, the, uh, the Norwester, and also there are flash floods that time, which was really um, the, very difficult to uh, uh, decipher whether which was the phenomenon that actually happened. If we look at the, uh, what is more important now, we have a disaster management uh, protocol and a model that has to be evolved. And you know that all the states and the ministry, the central government, they have a disaster mitigation and management authority everywhere. Earlier, they never bothered to have it. Now they have it. And if we have to go for disaster management model, we need to understand, we need to identify the hazard, prepare hazard maps and uh, to locate the threats. Uh, we, at the same time, we have to go in the, you might have an extreme hazard somewhere, but the habitation is poor. Nothing is there. There is no building. Risk will be minimal. So therefore, risk is very important. So we have to identify the risk. And this risk map and hazard map together will help in uh, resource allocation, emergency mapping for preparedness uh, during crises, emergency responses, recovery, and risk monitoring and updating for both non-structural as well as the structural. And now, whatever urbanization has happened, has happened, we are not going to demolish all of them. We should go and extirpate all of them, reinforce them. And that's what is being done. And it is being done almost in all the civilized and um, the developed and developing countries. So here, friends, this is the site for the economic map of India. Now, if we look at the 2,500 kilometer long um, Himalaya, this is basically is the main country. Why this happened? Because we know that the Indian uh, Indian update is going uh, higher, that, that is, uh, through to uh, below the Eurasian plate. In the process, the Himalaya was built. And uh, at the same time, when the Indian plate is going through because of the viscous pool and the gravitational pull down, when the thesis was totally consumed, uh, then there is a crustal shortening going on. And at the same time, there is a tremendous, uh, I mean, stress uh, developed along the, the plate margin, also on the uh, interplate and interplate. Um, uh, so therefore, we have earthquakes all over, be it the indo candidate plain, in the Bengal Basin, the northeast is being one of the five uh, uh, deadliest earthquake um, uh, source regime out here. We also have the Kashmir Himalaya, where we have 2005 uh, uh, Kashmir Mujafrabad earthquake took place. 
Come round, then we have to touch it. And all those, so very few, you could look at it. Uh, for in a touch, um, 2001 Abuja earthquake is very, very uh, recent in the memory, even though it has happened almost uh, 21 years back. Uh, so some of the earthquakes are almost like heritage earthquakes. So, so these are some of them. And so therefore, an Indian, India, the Bureau of Indian Standard in 2002, it is almost 20 years back, they uh, made a seismic donation map and uh, put it as zone 2, 3, 4, and 5. This map is almost a religious kind of thing, you know. Uh, uh, you, you have to show it and uh, give credence to the BIS and this needs an upgradation and we are now in the process of doing it. The National Steering Committee of the Ministry of Art Sciences uh, is doing, looking at 64 urban centers whose seismic microdonation has to be done and I am still chairing the, chairing the committee for last almost five years now. Uh, when Rajiban uh, was the secretary, he made it and still now it is continuing. So now this, with this, uh, these are again uh, the, uh, the impact of these earthquakes on the population path quite dramatic. If you see the population path quite dramatic, these are two dark, uh, the, uh, almost all the population, whatever, whoever is there, all of them are being affected by this ZDS earthquakes which have happened. And I told you only the strong earthquakes from 4.5 to 9.1. Let's go. And now if we look at my domain of discussion here, the focus is basically along this, going from Kashmir Himalaya all the way to uh, Northeast India, I've taken the entire terrain because it is very difficult to separate them out. And if you look at all of them, uh, you have huge uh, seismotectonic regime out here. We have the Meli Karabaram Pass, we have the Western Sunan called Hajar, the Hajar, 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 Hajar Kashmir, the Maxim, the Karabaram, then we have the uh, Chamoli, we have all the, the, the MBT, MCT, HSP, and all these. And in Northeast, we have uh, called, we have the design trust and so on and so forth. So if you look at the whole of the Indian scenario and look at all the tectonic provinces, you can see that all the tectonic provinces, the provinces at this point by are called the lineaments and therefore it does it is really deadly and all of them are, this is neo-tectonic active faults. So therefore all of them are active right now. So this shows you where we are sitting here, whether you have a safe building, whatever you do and whoever you have a Kurkumin and all this stuff, but if you cannot get yourself, uh, uh, I mean, ready for this and get yourself self urbanized, so it will be, you will feel the I would have done, have died out of cancer better than uh, seeing what is happening in this earthquake. So, therefore, friends, uh, what we did was the most important thing the seismotectonic atlas, you know, the DSI uh, prepared in 2000, and we still use it religiously. So 2002, religiously, 2000, religiously, right? This is what, everything is religiously. Then what the hell we are doing? So what we looked at is we have started looking at uh, uh, the lineaments and tectonic mapping of the whole entire India Peninsula and see what are the neo-tectonic and the active faults. So therefore, I think I'm audible, right? I don't need the mic. So therefore, with this, and I mean, we started uh, making, because if you do not have a good lineament and Tectonic map, you cannot do seismic. <coughs> it is not possible. So we started looking at it. This is the protocol, and I'm not uh, reading because my chairman is very unhappy uh, if somebody reads from there. So uh, this is what we did exclusively on the remote sensing. Uh, what data we use? We use uh, Landsat DM, uh, we have ETM, G3, G4, uh, SRDM, ASCAS, and RSI DM, and all those stuff. From here, we did uh, image processing, we did uh, very higher on the image processing and we got uh, the lineaments and different uh, domains. But these are the domains which are actually uh, the demarcated by us, it's a Bengal machine. And this is the Bengal machine lineament uh, uh, and, the tech, and the tectonic section. We have the indo gangetic forelet uh, region. This is a Darjeeling city Himalaya. This is the central India, these are Kashmir Valley. I have sent some of them, I am not showing. So finally, if you put all of them together with seismic seismicity and with the tectonic, if you take all of them together, you can divide the entire India, Indian Peninsula into 11 tectonic provinces. They are Bengal Machine right here, which it has got a maximum terrible earthquake of the order of 6.8. Then we have uh, Indo and reported with a magnitude of 8.2. Uh, Central India with a magnitude of 8.3. Uh, Kutch region will have a magnitude of 7.2 point over the region 
uh, is the right point of one region is right here, then Western Ghat, Mobile Belt, and then we have a Eastern Ghat, Mobile Belt, North West is India, right here, the Kashmir Himalaya and the Himalaya, and, India, India. India. and all of them together, if we look at, and then I did, uh, and look at the total, we need a very good size ratio, size is um, uh, I am in data. So what we did, we have the, between 1900 and 2018, as uh, we got selected about the G cluster, 64,153 main events. And these events, these maps, and uh, these data has been used for touristy seismic hazard assessment. And what you do, use them and divided the whole of India into two different uh, classes. One is uh, uh, the, the, I mean, the polygonal seismicity sources. And uh, these, all of them, we have about 132 polygonal seismicity sources at Four uh, high percent of depth region between 0 to 25, 25 to 70, 70 to, uh, one, 70 to 180, 180 and 182, uh, 300. So all of them, these are the polygon seismogenic sources, and with a big bone out here, and all of them are uh, are seismogenic, and each one of them will have a tectonic sources, and we have done the activity of this uh, within 0 to 25 kilometer uh, with 3.5 as the threshold magnitude, and uh, the, this uh, is at uh, for different uh, source regime, these are the tectonic sources, and these are the polygonal sources. If you look at one of them, let's explain. We find out in zone 12, uh, we have an A value, this B value here, a maximum uh, magnitude which we get, we predict from here by paper with uh, Richard Gutenberg relationship, which comes here. Uh, the maximum observed is 7.6, so this basically uh, tells you what exactly is the type of the error you are looking at. And so therefore, this, this is how we do this seismic analysis and do maximum earthquake prognosis here. And this actually is a single seismicity model which shows the uh, activity rate of all the uh, different earthquakes of magnitude 3.5 and above, 4.5 and above, and 5.7 and above. These are the formulations used. And this, in a way, is a proxy to tell you where are the concentration of stresses being happening and these are the asperity zones. Uh, these are the deadly asperity zones we have. Uh, this is the zone and at different hypocentral uh, ranges. This is uh, uh, 25, 0 to 20, 25, uh, 70, 70 to 180 and 182. So with this, we proceed and then use the model uh, for this uh, computational protocol. What we do, we try to find out uh, the annual uh, the frequency of accident for the ground motion A with activity rate for, we have already, I have shown you the activity rate for the tectonic sources and for the polygonal sources, we fix that. And then, then we have a, so we define a probability in terms of probability density function, so magnitude, the rupture distances, as well as the down motion prediction equations we take. And using this model, uh, uh, what we do, we have a, we have a computational protocol to gener generate computational protocol. And in this, we need the database. What are the database? Earthquake, a catalog, tectonic, down motion database, then socio tectonic, and then seismic tectonic model, seismicity, seismic source. I have shown all of them to you. And this is the logic tree framework with the, um, the, with the ground motion prediction equations I have shown you in a slightly uh, bigger version. So this is for the entire India, this is what. So we have the regional, uh, all the ground motion prediction, prediction equations given by everybody. There are probably uh, about 2,000 to 3,000 ground motion prediction equations, including our own ground motion prediction. So we did that. And then this is the probability seismic hazard of the entire India. This is updated. This is with a return period of 475 years of, of the death of the maximum earthquake. This is with a 2475 years of. So it is 2.5 kilometers. This is uh, 2.5 the, the, um, the, uh, kilo years. And this is with 500 years. So with this, this is what. And, and then this is the hazard level. I'm not reading it out. And these are spectral amplification because we need for a different uh, needed, uh, the spectral amplification to get the, uh, the design responses. This is the, so taking the ground motion, what we have, the PGA, with uh, the population density, wavelength density, and the uh, lateral land cover, uh, we get a seismic risk map of India with 500 years of risk here. So you can see what is happening here. Uh, and even here also, uh, for the core, uh, you are in Bengal Basin, basically Bengal and Manuji Basin combined together. So to, so to Orisha, so this is also, and we, we are done my project of uh, junction. So we are sitting here. So the whole of it is a hugely uh, the seismic risk zone. Uh, then this is the territory which I have the tendency consideration for higher domains. And this shows 
they at the bed at the engineering bedrock level and these are the hazard terms at different places because in Tipu uh, we have included even Kathmandu, the Nepal, uh, the Itanagar, Chittagong, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Kanpur, Amritsar and Srinagar. These are just some of them. And then the most important thing is what is happening at below. Yes, yes, I will wait. Give me six seven. Uh, so what is happening at below? As below 30 meters is uh, 30 meters is not very important. What happens at the surface? Because we will be finally they are getting a bit uh, a building and the urbanization made on the surface of the earth. So what happens here is very important. So this is how we do the site classification and and then and these are some of the data which we, have, we did by drilling and all from uh, for different types of geotechnical and geophysical uh, data in terms of uh, uh, modulus, because the shear of velocity, the fine content, the density and so on and so forth at different places. So, and this is the geophysical data. And then finally we convert uh, the SPD into geotechnical data into shear of velocity because that's what we need. And so these are the, some of the relations, these are developed by us and uh, these are already published. And then finally this is the site classification map of the entire uh, north, northeast uh, India to all the way up to Muscle Himalaya. So this has got all different types of classes, uh, including uh, site class M. And then we do the modeling because we need the ground motion at the bottom. And this is what is happening. So this is the epicenter of the earthquake. Suppose this is an 1885 bedrock earthquake, which has occurred in the Jumuna Fault, and which basically wrecked the entire um, Bangladesh, but nothing has happened to West, uh, West Bengal because of the directivity. So this, uh, we, when we model it, uh, we model it, is, this looks like it has a bedrock uh, with a PG of 0 0.063. But once it goes to, so this is the seismic bedrock, then it goes to engineering bedrock, and this is the soft uh, layer through which one it traverses, see how it has got amplified. So this amplification uh, from the soil cover of about 30 meters or 50 meters is the one which makes the thing more difficult and more uh, destructive. So this is, uh, no, so we do non-linear geophysical and non-linear modeling and this is the surface consistent holistic seismic hazard of the entire territory of our study region. And then uh, these are the uh, site response of different uh, in Bengal Basin, Indo Basin, Northeast, Northwest India, Kashi, uh, Darjeeling, and so on and so forth. So, here, these are the design response factors. This is what the engineer says. So, this is on the surface, but if you design it with the bedrock, then you see what is that deficit of it. So, how we look at that on uh, this? So, this is a huge gap. So, this has to be done on the surface. So, the building code has just been given by BIS is basically at the bedrock, and uh, this bedrock building code is what is happening the creating and which is today and this is the onus of the, the responsibility given to us and we are doing the micro duration to bring it to the surface level and get the new work building by law and this is the uh, as now what i do is i try to see the implication of this on the building type which we already have and so there are actually 11 different types of building like heritage building ductile reinforced building and non ductile layers for which is about, and these are the different types of buildings of high, low, uh, mid, and high ledge building. And these are their, this is the capacity curve, this is the fragility curves of all of them. And once we do the damage potential modeling, then this is what happens. Uh, if you see here, uh, this is in Srinagar, this is in Chandigarh, this is Gurgaon, this is in Chittagong, this is Asansol in so West Bengal, Kanpur, uh, Kanpur, Shillong, this, that. And all of them show this, this type of uh, damage potential, none, slight, moderate, extensive, and complete. There is none is virtually not there. Everything, everyone is showing uh, uh, and some sort of a destructive uh, potential. So with this, if we proceed now, and even human casualty, if we look at, so this is a, so if you look at the human casualty, you can see at three times of the day, the night time, day time, and community time, uh, we can find out what exactly is happening. So therefore, the concluding takeout, the takeaway is the vulnerability of the modern society towards earthquake hazard is increasing with time, and this is high time that we look at it. 59% of the total hand covers comprise of three morphological processes, and we have to stabilize it by uh, adopting the new building bylaws. As far as the size of hazard is concerned, this is uh, uh, the situation. So therefore, uh, we must understand there is always a slight discrepancy there because the problem that uh, the problem that it has come can never be solved at the level at which it has been created. So that's why there is always a discrepancy, but this discrepancy has to be made as minimal as possible. So therefore, 
I have given some of the in uh, pillars of earthquake management, which is very important. Then uh, ensure installation of earthquake resistant design. Then in uh, facilitate electric engineering and transfer retrofitting, which is very important now. Improve the compliance regime and improve the awareness and preparedness of all stakeholders. And uh, strengthen the emergency response capability in the Alpun areas and schools have to be developed and have to be upgraded. Friends, we are it's basically the travelers together on this bright blue uh, the ball in nothingness. Our aim has to be to basically to rejuvenate it with, it, with science of learning, universal science and technology practicing, and we uh, and use borderless design. <coughs> science. So it needs an international and national collaboration. <coughs> we have to stick to it. And finally, before I uh, go out, uh, the final thing that I would like to uh, read out is what Karl Marx was saying is to assume one basis for life and a different basis for science is a priority of all sorts. Natural science will in time incorporate into itself the science of man. Thus, uh, just as the science of man will incorporate into itself natural science, there will be only one science. Let us keep it keep in mind this and proceed forward and try to have a sustained uh, and um, a beautiful uh, uh, world uh, in front of us and work collaborate in a collaborative manner in all the branches of science and thank you very much uh, for your patient care. Thank you, Professor Nath. Very nice and exciting and completely new topic for young students. I think this is a very unique uh, talk. So we sincerely thanks Professor Nath for valuable spending his valuable time and giving such information. I'm sorry for a yes, I, <laughs> short I, I, time I, I, for you. <laughs> yes, time. A time. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, My request. Uh, 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 please, 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 please be there. Please be there. We want to. Uh, Dr. Nath is my friend and also is my competitor. Wherever we go for a high post, we both will go for an interview. So I want to respect him now with your kind permission. Thank you. He is now my mentor. <laughs> he is the Dada. We have been for 30 years. Oh, very good. And I came here because of his pushing. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been really difficult. Thank you very much. It has been really great. And thanks, my young friends, uh, for being with me in the audience. Uh, just to be, just to be, just to be, just to be. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, very much. I think uh, you all will agree that the first mo morning this uh, plenary has been very uh, thoughtful and uh, fully engaged. We all who were enjoying this lecture. Uh, I propose both of thanks to our chairman, uh, Professor Bhuraskar, uh, then uh, the speaker, Prakash Bhutte Sahab. The second speaker was uh, Professor Velraj. And then we had a very good uh, lecture of people's science by Professor Santoshkar. And uh, lastly, not least, very important one by Professor S. Nath. Thank you all very much for this uh, uh, profound, wisdom, wisdomful session. Now we are breaking for tea, and within uh, 10 minutes, we are coming back to reassemble here for the next session. Please join us for tea and uh, come back here as soon as possible.
இல்ல நான் மேல
Okay, it's, it's really great. It, it's a very rare combination. So I will, now that our friends are coming slowly and slowly, and I think you can pull through your presentation. Friends, are you ready with your presentation, sir? So I will now request and uh, invite Professor Boraskar, Boraskar to start uh, his presentation. So it is for uh, almost half an hour, maybe. No, it will not. It will not be half an hour. So it will be about seventy-five minutes. We have so therefore twenty-five minutes. So you try to be within twenty, twenty-two minutes. Twenty-two minutes. Thirty minutes. There will be two, two and a half. Two large. It will be one and a half. It is almost twelve o'clock now. Then we are one thirty. Okay, fine, 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 fine. All of all of us want to speak our heart out. So, Therefore, at least that opportunity should be given to everybody. Okay, sir. So, the stage is yours and we'll listen to you. All the best. Okay. So, good afternoon to everybody. I am thankful to Indian Social Science Academy for giving me this opportunity to deliver a talk in this plenary section. So I have chosen a subject, theme of the talk, which is uh, maybe interest to young students because uh, the theme of my talk is how we can clean the water because you know that we have, uh, say, cooperation drainage systems or we have got rivers which are polluted so everybody has a problem to clean the water so i'm just uh, focusing my talk on cleaning the water how one can clean the water so in addition i am also slightly shifting to radiation technology because uh, nowadays it has been found that conventional techniques are of course there, they are useful, they are adopted regularly. But radiation technology is also, in addition, being used by several countries, including India. So I will just uh, talk about that. And other aspect of the radiation technology is about the environment, because now we heard many talks on environment, because nowadays we face problem of pollution everywhere. So how to evaluate pollution, because the techniques which are used for evolution of pollution is mostly for the gases, CO gas or CO2 gas or nitrogen, other gases. But this technique which I'm going to talk about, the nuclear technique, which will tell you about the elements which are present in the atmosphere. Because the techniques which commercially systems uh, provide you information about the pollution, they are only based on gases, not by element. So the nuclear technique about which I will just touch, that will provide you information about the elements which are present in the given atmosphere. So title of my talk is Treatment of Wastewater Analysis of Environmental Pollution by Radiation Technology with focus on humanity. So as you know, water pollution occurs when harmful chemicals, microorganisms, and other substances are mixed with a stream of river, lake, uh, or ocean, dam. So there are the uh, reasons why we get polluted water. And similarly, the air pollution is caused by contamination of air due to presence of particulate matters and gases in atmosphere. So these particulate are harmful to the health because there are many places where we don't know what type of elements are present. So only analysis can tell you. So this is an example of the air pollution cities, but we can only find the gases which are there because more but not the elements. Similarly, the polluted air, uh, polluted rivers we have got. So how to clean the water? That was my topic of today's talk. So when you say uh, polluted water, there's normally a term used is wastewater. So wastewater is used for polluted water as well as polluted. So I just given a definition that what is wastewater? So water that has been affected by domestic, industrial, commercial, and other reason called wastewater. And there are wastewater is divided again in four categories, domestic wastewater, municipal, industrial, and agricultural. So domestic wastewater, when we take bath or we use our own uh, home systems, 
the drainage water is taken by the pipes and given to the municipal sewage. So municipal sewage, of course, is there and that needs cleaning of the water again. So there is again agriculture waste because now uh, yesterday we had a talk about agriculture. So many people do not know that the water which is uh, flown out of the land or agriculture land, it contains a lot of this pesticide. And this pesticide finally go to river or nearby village, uh, uh, well or only. So it is also necessary for us to clean the water which comes out of agriculture activities or villages, of course, there is, this is a village. So there is a, some water, so all the contaminated waters are there. So nowadays, of course, the government or municipal corporations, they try to have program to clean the water. So main problem comes from the textile industry. The most uh, polluted water we always get from the uh, textile industry because reason is that you can see the color water. Because all the textile industries, they use uh, different types of color and they are made up from the organic materials. And therefore, they are most harmful to the human being. So most uh, problem with the, any corporation or any agency is to tackle this uh, polluted water, particularly that comes from the textile. Of course, the government of India has put a lot of restrictions on the textile industries that they cannot uh, throw out their water without cleaning. So, so most of the industries are taken care, but still some industries avoid and they just throw their water into the river. So this is most problematic there because the textile industries, hazardous chemicals, dyes, polymer oil, fats, waxes, and carcinogenic material. This is more dangerous for the human health. So from this point of view, there are some techniques are used. So again, the same thing that uh, many companies are told that the, they just put the water in the river. Here also textile industries that they're putting their water in nearby river or uh, municipal drainage system. So we are getting polluted water everywhere. Most of cities have this problem. Similarly, the water finally comes to our uh, river and so our river gets polluted. So now the government of India has started a program to clean the river. So whatever I'm talking, is also one of the technique they use for cleaning the water. So treatment of water. So the before discharging into river and other bodies of water, it is necessary to clean the waste water by removing dyes, organic substances, pollutants, and pathogens from the municipal sewage and industrial water. So this is the main objective, what we call as the treatment of water. So the treatment of water is again carried out in several stages because there is no one stage which can clean the water. You have to follow two, three stages or four stages. So the important stages, one is the physical stage, other is chemical, third is biological, and then advanced oxidation and the radiation. So radiation, as I told you, I added is the addition one. This is not very commonly used by in India, but it is very... So I just come to physical treatment. So wastewater is passed through the drainage of water which comes out of the corporation drainage or river. So it is filtered by some techniques, by large size pieces of solid debris, food particles. They are very easily removed by the first stage which we call as a physical treatment. So you can see in cities, there are uh, these uh, clarifiers are there. So these are, they are the clarifiers. So the clarifiers, are, once the water is uh, passed through filters, it, the clarifiers are used to store the water. So they are the clarifier. So filter water is transferred to the primary clarifier. So they are called primary clarifiers. So they are nothing but the storage of water with a facility on the top here that the top uh, soft which are floating on the top, uh, some uh, low density material, say paper or then they can be removed from the scraper, the skimmer available. And other things here, Again, this is a system for storage of water or biological system. So this is a system which cleans the water from a given uh, city, you can say. So this is, again, same thing which I have told you. So clarifier is a special type of water storage tank with mechanical facility to skimmer and scraper. So skimmer means on the surface, whatever is there, you can remove it. And because the skimmer is the mounted on the rotatable shaft fixed on the center, the skimmer can be slowly rotated around the clarifier 
solid moves on the wastewater. So slowly it will move on the wastewater, remove on the surface impurity, and then there's a heavy weight or heavy density material will go down on the bottom and that can be removed. So this is just an example here, micro particles are there. So what they do, just chemical which are covalent chemicals such as aluminum chloride, ceric, they are added to the water. So the, this slide I have shown you, first they fill the water and then add, uh, add their covalent uh, chemicals. So they are the, say aluminum chloride or ferric chloride are added. So the suspended tiny particles, they, because they are nuclear particles, they are, this uh, chemical arranged uh, to join small, small particles together and you get this kind of system. So particles are, uh, because the micro particles which are there, we cannot uh, see and we cannot filter out. But once you add the chemical, the particles go to the higher side, which you call as a micro particle. And then further, uh, they give some time and so again, some pollutants uh, are again, are lightweight, they are float on the surface. Again, some pollutants, uh, chemicals are added. So you can see that micro particles grow to higher side and they come on the surface. So surface particles are again removed. So they are out of the drainage water which you have got. But still, there is another uh, system which is called flocculation process. It is carried out for increasing particle size. So after adding special type of chemical in water, water is still. So the tiny particle which you are seeing, they collide and stick to each other and large size pollutant particles are produced and undergo process of sedimentation. So this is a picture. Initially you got this, then the pollutant you add, size, and finally they settle down at the bottom. So this chemical uh, process, you know, chemical uh, uh, technology you can say they are used so sedimentation process will so all the say pollutants which uh, become uh, uh, lower than the density of the water they will flow and those become higher than density of the water they will come down and then the scrapper they are removed so this is the best way to clean the water from system so this is the same thing again which i have explained to you so first we got a before then the component is added and then the component. So this is a way we can remove micro particles to uh, make them higher size and they can be removed from the water. So this is again the same picture here. So in the small cities or small villages, these uh, plants are now government is supporting. So first uh, water will be filtered here, then the component will be added, then flocculation, then sedimentation they will just put and then there will be filtration again disinfection, the chlorine is added, and water is supplied to the public. So they will not use directly for drinking, but for other purpose, for washing purpose, or other purpose, they can definitely use. So this type of plants are nowadays, government is now implementing in the small villages for providing the dirty water or uh, municipal drainage water to the public for use. And for agriculture purpose, of course, it is a very good uh, water which they can use. But other, other methods, because this uh, method which I have shown you, it cannot remove organic uh, with the water is having textile uh, pollutants or organic pollutants, then uh, we cannot use this system. And therefore, treatment of water by other methods are there, so that chemically treated water is suitable for discharge into river or for limited domestic use. So this water we can discharge to river, which is chemically clean, or for domestic use, for washing clothes or washing some thing, thing or for gardening they can use. However, this chemical method cannot be used for treatment of industrial wastewater because municipal drainage water and industrial wastewater can be treated by biological method using bacteria and different types of clay fire. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, treatment method. They use biological method to uh, treat the wastewater which is received from industries or something. So this is called chemical or biological method. So the biological technology, there are some type of microorganisms are there, which are used, they are very powerful to break the organic uh, material, such as bacteria called algae, fungi. So they are the names of different uh, types of uh, this microorganism. They are used for degrading pollutants of the wastewater. So two types of biological process, one is aerobic treatment, which is carried out in the presence of supply of oxygen. And another is anaerobic uh, treatment, which is carried out in the absence of oxygen. So normally, aerobic treatment is preferred 
because the anaerobic treatment, the methane gas is evolved from the water, and therefore the methane gas is not recommended for the human uh, say for us or for the environment. So this treatment uh, aerobic anaerobic is normal use in the city. Out of city, suppose you are there, then aerobic uh, is used. So in this case, a very simple technique is used. We have a tank, and with the nozzles are there. So this uh, tank has got a facility that you can pump the air inside the tank. So tank is filled with the water, and then the facility of passing oxygen from the bottom through nozzles. So tank is filled with the industrial water, and a large amount of microorganism through activated sludge is. So there is a sludge. In in that they are of polymer type and their microorganisms are attached to this system. So they are put inside this, and then the water uh, is filled with the water here, and then air is uh, pulled from the nozzles. So you will get this kind of system. So continuously air is coming. So this is aerated water. So very interestingly, the microorganisms get oxygen from the air, and they break the. Of the uh, aromatic uh, or organic uh, molecules, which are uh, obtained from the mostly textile or industrial waste water, because our day-to-day uh, -day life, what we are using, that does not contain the organic uh, chemical uh, pollutant, but only industrial. So this technique is used. So very simple: uh, fill the tank, put organism, and uh, put air from the bottom. Then the water will be aerated, as we see here. So, the microorganism consumes the organic substances as their food and break down it. So, during the process of 20-30 hours, a large fraction of soluble and susceptible organic matter is converted into small chemical species like CO2, H2, H2, and they get loaded. So, the sludge containing microorganism is <coughs> the sludge containing microorganisms is produced under gravity. The sludge is settled down and Removed from the bottom, so the water. Uh, thank you. So the sludge which is uh, down, this is uh, removed from the system. So gases evolve from top, and the sludge which is the broken down uh, chemicals. Will go down, and the sludge containing microorganisms is also produced. So under gravity, the sludge settles down and subsequently removed from the bottom. So this is the process uh, in short. So you have a filter water, water. Then you put aerobic uh, air air bubble will be there. Then you transfer it to secondary clarifier where the sludge will get settled down and the top uh, layer. So again you filter it again. You push it once. So two three cycles are there. Then the water can be used. So this technique is very useful and very sensitive uh, to and very strongly uh, used or very uh, this uh, effectively used to remove organic matters or or impurities from the water. So this is repeated. You can uh, have aerobatic here. Gas is coming. It's the uh, microorganisms are uh, now eating the or uh, breaking the down. Then here there is secondary clarifier. <coughs> It will be put it for the two three days. So heavy sludge will come down here, and pure water, but pure water again is transferred to filter, and again second cycle. So two three cycles we do, and then finally this water can be used for the public purpose. So now I come to the radiation technology. So radiation technology, of course, uh, there as I told you, the biological method is not effective for distillation of textile pollutants and organic pollutants because it takes a lot of time. You As I told you, you have to make several. Uh, uh, the, so this processing time is very large. You break the water again, put it back again, put it back. So maybe 10 to 20 cycles you have to do. Then only you can remove the system. Whereas the radiation technology, the biological method is not effective degradation for textile pollutants and other things. So the technology is therefore used treating wastewater containing organic pollutants and other things. So there are two types of radiation sources used. One is electron beam or gamma ray. And third, second is the ultraviolet. <coughs> so this is a very simple technique. So countries like uh, Australia, Japan, India, USA, they are they are in Korea. They are now regularly using this technique for the treatment of water. So electrons of energy have been used successfully 
for degrading dyes, pesticide, toxic substances, wastewater discharge from textile and chemical industries, and killing pathogens in the municipal space. This is very important. So the pathogens are also killed along with the degradation of the uh, pollutants. So these are the uh, electrons, so gamma source here. So 1.7 mv gamma are used here uh, for this uh, technique because I had written here electron beam. So electron beam is also used and there is a source which is called cobalt 60 source is used gamma ray. So there where the facilities of electron beam are not available, then cobalt 60 source is used which provides gamma rays. So the electron accelerator is shown here. So the beam will be scattered and uh, make in the large uh, diameter. And so this is the electron source. So these facilities are easily available now in India and also abroad. So when you, so what is the basic technique here? When you irradiate a water by electron beam or for gamma ray, the H2O water is uh, releases into different H, HO3, H3O, H2O2, O2, H2. So the water changes to releases. And it has been found that this uh, reactive species, OH or H2O2, H, they are very effective in degrading the uh, organic chemicals. So once this water is irradiated with the electron beam, then you have different species present in the water and they will react with the organic uh, contaminant and they will degrade very effectively. So they are the, of course, uh, equation I have written here. So when you irradiate uh, wastewater, the water is more. So H2O gets uh, releases and it fragment OH, H, OH3, H2. So they are the species which are used for uh, degrading the system. So they are the same thing which I have written here. So when you irradiate the water, 50% uh, changes to H2O, H2O plus, and 50% changes to H2O plus. H2O two plus the other uh, species are there. So there are the things here, H2O two plus and H2O two. So this, this is actually not plus, this is the excited uh, state of the H2O. So the excited state is there where it can break down and this is H2O two. So again, the same thing is I explained to you, HOH, H2O. So there are species are produced. And these species are used to degrade the chemical which uh, are from textile or industrial use. So this is the following reactives are produced, as I told you. So what they are highly reactive species and degrade water, wastewater, sewage water by killing pathogens, oxidation, hazardous organic destruction of molecules. And so they are very effective. They can change the color also. So I will show you some examples how the color. No, half an hour, no? <laughs> so the uh, water is flown <coughs> through some pipe and the electron beam is uh, the water is exposed to electron beam and you can see the electron beam is uh, uh, so there are different ways by which the water can be irritated by system so <coughs> in the industrial way there are the electron accelerators are there and water is flowing through these pipes and the continuously electron beam is used for uh, degradation of the textile water and industry water. So this is the way once you irradiate it, they are again cleaned by a different tower and they finally we get the reservoir of the good system. And there are the organic pollutants which I told you, they can be degraded very easily by the electron. So Pune City, we have carried out a lot of work in this field. <clears throat> in Pune City, we have electron accelerator called Microtron, and we also have uh, Cobalt 60. And the X-ray is from there is a synchrotron radiation source at Indore that we have used for this study. <clears throat> so this synchrotron radiation source it used very hard uh, X-rays from the system. So the electron moves and the X-rays are coming. So we are using this. So we are doing the so same thing. The X-rays also produce this species and the breakdown of the organic compound. So we have irradiated different chemicals by election and uh, we have studied by COD chemical oxygen and UV spectrum, different uh, aspects we have studied. And then we can see that the degradation uh, by UV spectrometer 
when the water degrades, its a peak uh, for the absorption decreases. So this shows a sign that water has been cleaned. So U.S. spectrometer 266 is the peak where we get this kind of depletion. And this is the CO2 chemical oxygen demand. So this is also a parameter to measure the whether the water is degraded or is purified or not. So that also we have studied there. <coughs> so ultraviolet uh, radiations are also used uh, for this study in this case. So ultraviolet radiation also used for a study as a home, you must be having water filter. So there you must have seen the ultraviolet uh, light is there and it is also used for killing the microns. So these rejections are same. So you can see them when your uh, water filter, there is a UV lamps are added. So they do the same thing, UV kills the pathogen and also break down the organic system. So in your home, you will find this type of uh, systems available there. So industrial also, their UV lights are there and water flows from the top. So they are also clean by system. Now I'll come to environmental pollution. Just five minutes, I will say. <clears throat> so environmental pollution, we know that a lot of uh, gases are involved here and we have got a city here. So I told you that uh, a technique which is used by uh, this uh, standard uh, techniques which are used, they give you only the particle size 2.5 micron or uh, 10 micron, they are the two standards of the particle size that the machine can measure. But the elements which are present are not measured. So here, for there are filters are available in the market. So you can mount the filters on the building. And so the filters will, what the filter will do? The particles which are passing, the size of the filter is very small. So the particles are carried in the filter. And these filters, you can have at different places where you want to measure the pollution. So the, the filter, you can see a lot of elements are trapped. So they are all elements which you cannot see by a naked eye, but they are stabbed here. And there is a technique called pixie technique. So in this technique, the proton beam is irradiated on the filter and the X-rays which are coming out of it, they are measured. So from X-rays, we can find the technique. And you can see this is a picture here. It is a purely uh, clean air. So this is the spectrum. And when you uh, take a filter from a city, you can see so many elements are present. Lead, zinc, copper, vanadium. So all these elements are always, we have got many uh, systems you can see. Aluminium, silver, manganese, copper, lead. So these are the uh, particles which are present in the system. So this technique is very powerful to estimate the actual element present in your atmosphere. So this is a particle for the dust. There is a dusty place, say Registan. There the people have studied this kind of thing. Again, so there are various types of elements you can see at different, all over the country, you can see different types of spectrum is available. Now, this is a just spectrum from a person who was working at petrol pump. So petrol pump earlier, we used to have lead in the petrol. Now, of course, we get lead free. So earlier, those who were working, you can see there is a lead found in the blood of the uh, workers, those who work on the petrol pump. So now for government has banned uh, this uh, type of petrol. But earlier, there are many people, those who worked uh, 15 years back, they suffered because of the contamination of the lead. So maximum permissible concentration of the, uh, as per government of uh, India, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, petroleum. So all this uh, we can find from the standard uh, company, uh, commercial facilities which are available, we can find this. But as the elements, as I told you, which you cannot find it. So similarly, water also can be, water pollution also, we can study, put the filter in the water and uh, measure. So the drinking water, pure drinking water, if you check, even if you find that some elements are there. So though we say the water is pure, but it is not pure, it still contains some elements in it. So these are the pixel from river. So there are many types of uh, water you can see. So the typical spectrum recorded from filter, we dipped in the polluted water. So if you take a polluted water, you get so many uh, elements in the water also, polluted water also. So this technique is very powerful for finding this thing. So there's the effect of arsenic. So arsenic is very harmful to the body. I put it in the water in the village. There are many places where the arsenic is present 
and it gives a lot of uh, problem to the human health. So this is one of the example toxicity of the arsenic. People may suffer from this. So that's why it is very important to measure the concentration of element in different parts of the India about the water, drinking water. So there are the standards uh, here available. The lead should be so much. This is the maximum limit of the element drinking water. So there are the different limit in the water element. So thank you very much. I will just stop this. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. I request uh, Dr. Shankar Kumar Nath to present the memento and shawl to our speaker, Dr. V. N. Brohraspa. Uh, Professor Shakil Ahmed and groundwater uh, synonymous. He is the person who is the leader of groundwater research in India. And finding his importance of his research, the French people came to India to establish the Indo-French Center for Groundwater Research. And he has published hundreds of papers, National Mineral Awadi, Fellow of National Academy of Science, Allahabad, and Fellow of the World Academy of Science this year. And now I am a fellow of Indian Academy of Social Science also. Very soon. Please, very soon. And um, he has done a remarkable work on fluoride contamination, arsenic contamination, groundwater, you know, and he is authority in groundwater research in India, groundwater modeling, science of groundwater. So, I, so Shakil, you please dice with us. Well, thank you so much, my friend, Dr. Pasta. See, we are just like almost twin brother because we worked also and <laughs> we retired also almost almost same time, basically. <laughs> so that's very nice. I'm very happy to be here with you. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. And um, I'm thankful, first of all, to the Crescent as well as Isa. As well, Isa is very, looks very nice. <laughs> that to make me present here to before you. And uh, only thing is, my friend Pasa is supposed to, be to deliver a lecture now, right now. With, uh, and anyway, I thought also that take this uh, challenge and sensitize everyone. See, you can see my title. I'm sure you must be surprising what is that written here. The putting groundwater into minds of the people, making visible is not enough. Why I'm not in that? Because if you, those who are, uh, those who are, uh, yeah, those who are, uh, who belong to water science or water resources. Uh, 22nd March has just passed and 22nd March is celebrated all over the world as the World Water Day. And, and you know, water anyway is so important. Nobody sitting in this hall or elsewhere also can say, I have nothing to do with water. You have to do with water or something. And I'm happy that the, my first um, lecture was, of course, here the, there also was on water. And I really compliment the speaker that he has, he has, Put, in, put something which we have remarked that wastewater. And he says, he's, I knew his intention was that we should not say it waste. Waste means we can't do anything. But he says wastewater should not be called waste, it should be called polluted water at the most. So I really compliment you, sir. This is very nice thing that now we should realize because water has become so important that everybody is concerned and everybody has to think in a different way, of course. So uh, on this 22nd this year, uh, March 22nd March, they were. UN had declared a theme, which they declare every year, groundwater making invisible visible. I had to think also what to do. Of course, this was very relevant to us because NGRI 
will work on geophysics and geophysics is only can make this invisible visible because you cannot go inside. You have to make it through some, some scientific method, right? But my point was, I thought I must take it beyond that because you can make it visible. But what to do with it, I'll prove this, what we are doing. We are not really serious with that. That's why I put this title. It is not enough that to make it visible. You have to put in the mind of the people unless that, that point time has come now. And so, so okay, let me start. Otherwise, I don't want the Shankar not to knock me. <laughs> That. Okay, so you see this this um, because last year's uh, title was that that valuing water. You know that you have to value water because water is life and everything. So I'll go back. See here, this slide is very very dangerous, and we, this is a fact. But this is a fact. Water is such a commodity which is good for life, which is necessary for life. But then water is such a commodity which has always a disaster. You can see all three types. Whether it is too much of water, the disaster. To less water also is disaster, polluted water is disaster that have been seen now. So, in if you don't value water, if you don't be careful, or then the well, it would be the big or every time you will get disaster only. That you can see that I don't explain that you know very well. Tsunami also is there that Chennai has been observed that those who are here now, and this flood is every every year you will listen that this whether Bangalore has got flood or Nawaz got flood, Delhi has got flood. So it is because of the excess water. Something excess is always supposed to be good, but this is not good. <laughs> now, you see this situation is very, very miserable in the way there is no water to grow crops. We have no water for drinking. You see, such if this is our life that we should get a drop of water this way. So the fatigue, and the third one, of course, is the pollution. So if you move further, groundwater actually is under the ground, so as you can say by the name itself. So you cannot directly see, you have to see through some techniques of uh, scientific techniques and all that. So here I would like to tell you why I put that the title, you have to put the groundwater into the mind of the people. And of course, uh, you see this, uh, this is a scene of 1980s, several uh, decades ago, in a, uh, this is a real, a real uh, data actually. There were only two bore wells in a small area of 55 square kilometers in near Hyderabad where we worked. And I would like to show you this first because this is something which you cannot show. See that. Those who don't know, I mean, those who don't work on the water science or groundwater, you can't see this one because you are here. And you see only the whatever seen from the visible eyes. But the groundwater is like that. You see, it is not an ocean of water inside the surface. It is the, it is, it is, it's, you can see the percentage, very, very few percent is there. But you need water because you need crops. So you go on pumping. Usually in the 80s from dug wells, dug well, you know that large diameter well and you can, it was, because that time technology was not there and we used to dig with the hand and all those things and you pump because we need water. So you do that. So what the people have done, they have not thought that what will be the consequences, they go on doing that and the water is over in the dug well, there is no water in dug well. But then that was not enough because it was possible to bore, uh, dig a bore well also and drill here. So they have drilled that again, pump, start pumping and this also was gone. But that's why I am saying every time I'm reminding you that we have to put ground water into mind of the people because this was not enough. Here they, they have not thought anything else. They have gone further because technology is available. Now we can drill very, we can drill kilometers now and we can pump out also. But without thinking that what are we doing? Actually? And you see this side also, I, I forgot to tell you about this side, left hand side, there were two bore wells in the 1980s. Now there are about several hundreds. And that's why if you go to the next slide, now so many bore wells pumping all out, water is over. Because water is infinite, it's not infinite, it is finite. Right? And although, although it is renewable, but you see you have to match the two speeds, the way it is going inside, the way you are taking out. It is it is very simple to tell because I'm happy to, to stand before the people who are mostly from social science and it's very common sense. You know that everybody has got their bank account. We all have bank account, nobody can say now. The government has made everyone to make the heavy bank account. You know very well the amount of deposit. The amount of withdrawal cannot be more than the amount of deposit. It's so simple. That's what is happening here. So this is literally disaster that no water here. All the bore wells are existing. About 900 and my next slide will tell you the statistic. Out of 935 bore wells, 200, more than 200 got dry. So you lost the amount. You lost the money. 
So what do you say? That's why you have to think. That's why I told that you have to put the ground attack into minus people. Then only at least you have to save these 200 bore wells. Because you know that you are drawing from the same source. Whether you draw from the two bore wells or you draw from 900 bore wells. You're not going to play, you're going to have the magic. So this is my starting. I'll go very quickly with some, some slides which I have. So, <coughs> well, these are things that how do you manage all those things. But then, then comes the climate change. Because is, before even that, also we were doing the wrong things. Still even, but then now climate change has added our problems. You know that climate, something I've written, of course, but you know very well, you are in Chennai, you now the things are told that Sea, rise, sea rise, uh, level rise will be there, there will be more evaporation, there will be uh, erratic rainfall. Erratic rainfall is the most important thing for groundwater, let's say. You are seeing very clearly everywhere. I'm going to show you some more slides also. So let's start from here. This is the hydrological cycle. Uh, water, uh, the whole cycle is there. And the time scale is one year, of course. And then the, what all happens that you can make out. And you know everything. You know how the evaporation takes place and clouds uh, condensation comes down with the snow and the rainfall. And then, of course, after that, there are two circles are drawn, and that represents the surface water and the groundwater. Here is the major thing. We can other thing we can leave it out. What happens? Maybe that somehow the situation may be like this: the two circles change their size. One is groundwater, is the surface water, or it could be this way as well. So here is the problem. The climate change has changed the circle. And uh, you see that what happens because of the erratic rainfall. Just think of you, you must be, I mean, those who are 30 years, 40 years old, you know very well in 30 years, 40 years before, the rainfall was very different. Although in 36 says today, the IMD, if you go to IMD, say, oh, the annual rainfall has not changed. That's correct. Annual rainfall has not changed. But if you go to daily basis, then you'll find a change. 10 days rainfall comes, falls down in one day. And then nine days are totally dry. Now, this is very clear to see that. If you see very well uh, what happened, that the very simple logic of anywhere, like if you have to go, the, I'm talking about the speed. You see, the way, that's how I told that 10 days rainfall comes in one day, our night. So you can imagine how, what will be the speed. And then the groundwater, oh, it has already gone this side. Okay, the groundwater, is is formed with the percolation. That is speed is much much slower than the speed the rainfall. So here comes the truth that if the 10 days rainfall comes in one day, obviously only 10 percent or even less than that will be percolated. The remaining will be runoff. So that's how you see that the cities or the places get flooded because the runoff is much more. It used to be so there is no drainage system or we're not ready for that. And so that was, that is also loss. And here also the groundwater is not created. The groundwater is not formed because of the recharge is less. And not only that, those things, you think, this is of course common sense we can make out. But the other thing which I'm going to tell you, the recharge does not take place because, of, uh, because the nine days which are going dry, first of all, you have the speed difference, so recharge doesn't take place. Also, whatever goes inside, Nine days are totally dry, they also again get evaporated. So you can see that it is quite possible that there could be a zero recharge from the rainfall. Now, where, where from the groundwater will come? So that's how it is groundwater which got much more affected by the climate change here. And also, there are so many things that the people are trying. So it, the gap between the top and the water, groundwater level also increasing, that is affecting all those things. That, of course, that is detail. But this is a very clear thing that we, we have to agree that the climate change had reduced the groundwater recharge a lot. Then what to do? Of course, these are some, some proofs. So I think I'll skip because now what you have to do, you have to do like this. Earlier you used to have your umbrella like this. Now you have to put your umbrella like this. Very simple thing. Right. And that you can make out very well because we need to collect the water now because it is not being going to the groundwater on its own in a natural way. So you have to collect them, put them artificially. It is simply like your bank, bank balance is not negative. So, I mean, simple thing like you are doing, you are, you are perhaps you're getting monthly salary and you're able to use that. Now you're doing more, more than that and in the salary reduce something like that. Then you'll say, okay, you may go some other job, put double the salary somewhere. So, of course, only. 
anyway so let me move to this and so the thing is that this will enhance the, the recharge of the groundwater and also research and implementation to go hand in hand of course and detail geo so when you have to nature of course does everything you know nature is great but when you have to do yourself forcefully then you are not nature so you don't know knowledge so then you must know what is below the ground because if you are forcing a, a rain or rain water to pour inside you must know that otherwise sometimes you know that i am not going to discuss but sometimes it's quite fast you are forcing something and without knowing will be really disaster could be disaster perhaps so that's why here what i am to emphasize that the your geoscientific knowledge geoscientific means knowledge of, of the ground water of the ground of the subsurface so here it is this is where we come into picture because you see that i'm proving i'm showing you some real picture here what happens if the rain falls on this it will not go inside not percolate because it is very massive rock the rain falls over here only but you cannot control the rain to fall over there so you have to really understand that right so so many pictures like that and over here also over here and then you know the part of that the dug wells have gone dry very miserable pictures no water at all and of course these also have to be understood that how this water will percolate of course but nature makes such situation is possible but then uh, i have told you that the reason the phenomena has changed that's how we have to make ourselves so so we have to make that ground water making invisible visible i have told you that this is the slogan for this year's uh, world water day was there so how do you do that actually what is that you have to go inside the earth this is not possible right but we do that of course we will we will getting the same knowledge but then through some other way so so here comes the geophysics i happen to work in lot of time with national geophysical research institute also so geophysics of course there are two things in our science geology and geophysics geology is again like you what you can see from your naked eye and then of course geologists they put lot of i, I appreciate actually lot of brain to uh, think much 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 better and the geophysicists they use the tools they think uh, i should not say less but then they use more the the equipment the tool and based on that they did think so of course a combination of let's say let's say forget about the comparison but the combination of geologists and geophysicists will be the best so this is some picture i mean you don't have to forget about like go much more detail this is some picture is called invasive method that without do digging without going inside you can image the in sub surface or geophysicists also great geophysicists sitting here don't know very well and this shows the color shows that this is called resistivity resistance of a material you know very well as a common sense also like if the resistance is very very high that could be a compact material and it less it means that loose material so like that so we we are at the top but we can get this information without digging without invading that so here you see that this looks to be a very massive rock so obviously water cannot percolate in that very well here the water will percolate percolate or maybe water is present over here so without digging also that's this help you you know new well drilling also okay i am just uh, giving an example because uh, without the knowledge of some surface we should we may be wrong or we may get in uh, into disaster actually there was a tank Uh, very quickly i'll tell you the, this is a bottom of the tank or lowest part of the tank and this is the upstream so obviously when the rain fall and enough happens the water will flow from this side to this side and this red mark will be filled up the first one but you see what i have in showing that when we got the sub surface information we found that where the lowest part is there water will be filled here the inside the earth there is no space this this uh, you can see the dark brown that is a complete compact rock there is no space so even though you are allowing the water to go there and get percolated but it will not percolate because there is no space rather at this place there is lot of space but this place unfortunately in the upstream water will not stay there because the lowest water will go at the lowest part, bottom so what we did then we have also checked that if we can if we can create this divide the same tank is there divide the tank artificially and put some barrier over there that the water is going to the lowest part stay here then the recharge was enhanced by almost three times so of course don't have to go detail but the thing is that the the message is that without the knowledge of sub surface we do this thing i mean play with the ground water it may be may be useful may not be useful actually so why we waste, waste this time on so this is what is the importance now i'll show you something very quickly that the importance of the data because 
any scientific studies based on the information and data you have. Now you collect data at some points, you get some values, red and blue, and you give to one scientist, say, interpret that. He says, well, this looks to be something, a channel going this way because it has got all red and surrounding by the blue values. Same thing we give to a second person. He said, no, it is not like that. It is like this. You have the same data and same situation is thing, but then two interpretations. Both cannot be true. One only will be true. Or maybe both are not true. <laughs> Unless you get much more data. So here what I am telling you, the importance of data sufficiency or adequacy, you can say. So for that, actually, the geophysical method which I have shown you, it is, it is very uh, hard work, actually, cumbersome and not very easy to collect such data. That's why nowadays the technology is available and NGRI already has got into this picture and we are uh, using the Heliborn survey, in fact. Here I'll just explain to you a little bit, of course, uh, I cannot go much in detail because of time, but it is quite possible. This is earlier which I have shown you, that was the rest method called analytical method. And those who know a little bit science also don't know very well. For analytical method, you need the contact. So we send the current in the ground, so we need the contact. But there's another similar method which is called electromagnetic method. And our expert is here sitting also before me. So this simple thing, electromagnetic method, you all know. If I ask you, you'll say simply no, but I'll tell you, everybody uses the cell phone. Everybody uses the television, sort of remote, this, that. Everything works on the remote, on the electromagnetic methods. The advantage is that it doesn't require any contact. You see, that's why. Otherwise, you have to go always, all the time to television and switch, change the channel. You can imagine earlier, if I only do the sun, there was no problem. Now, hundreds of channels, 100 times, how can you go and come back, change the channel and come back and see? It's all possible because of the electromagnetic waves. So here also, we are using the same thing. We are using the electromagnetic waves to send inside the earth, which can now go up to 500 meters or more even now, and can come back with the information of the ground, under, uh, underground, say. And now, of course, I, this that will be much more detailed, but here there is a helicopter, you can see that, and there is a loop, this is the equipment, which sends the electromagnetic wave, comes out and records that. So with this, when it comes out, it brings back the information of the underground. And which, of course, we, we have to struggle a lot with the geologists, geophysicists, what could be. Then we can get the information without going inside. And I think I'll skip this one, but I'll show you that at certain places, uh, you can get the complete and very continuous imaging. That's why it's, 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 a, it's nothing but the imaging. Like you have a CT scan, you imagine your body also in exactly the same way. The earth is imaged. The subsurface is, is imaged. And the two advantages, one is, yes, yes. <laughs> image, uh, image, that means you get continuous information and you go very fast because you're using a helicopter. So the speed is very fast, much, much faster. Right, so I'm going to show you uh, different places which are, these are, this is based on geology. I think I like to go fast here, but you just emphasize that up to 500 meter depth, you can get very detailed information and that is very much useful to decide where to put water, where to take water also, both in the same time. You see here, and then I think I have, here in Chennai also we work, not in Chennai, in Kondur actually we work, and we've seen that they, this, this, this river, you know very well, this is a parent channel, and there's some, at the depth also, saline water is found. So, and saline water, of course, is saline water, ingress is all those things are very important here. In the deep. Chennai is suffering a lot, things are those. Now, what I'm going to show you a very, uh, I mean, very interesting thing that this method, how do we get the knowledge of the subsurface? You see, you are at the top here somewhere, very, very lot, lot of greenery, and this is the 3D actually picture. So you don't know, you can't see, I'm just cutting that, but since you are here, but then with this method, you can cut down, go down, you see the variation. It is not uniform at all. It is much, much more variable than what we can imagine. You see that it go down again 25 meter, I think, and then again 25 meter, and I go up to almost 100 meter down we go, and we can determine with this, we can find out where is the massive rock, where is the channel, where is the flow taking place, where, everything you can find out very easily. Some uncertainties, of course, are there that I'm not going to discuss now. So this is what is the advantage of this. So this is what is making the groundwater invisible, visible. Because you cannot say from your naked eyes, but through this scientific method, you can see that groundwater visible. Right, so my final message is this. Again, saying the same thing, putting into the 
mind of the people. Conserve rain. This is the slogan of the government of India also. Catch the rain where it falls, where it falls. That's what you have to do. And we already proved that it didn't require because the natural way the recharge is not taking place. So you have to do, everybody's duty is there. Actually. You don't say that it's only government duty. Everybody's duty. Subsurface, achha, the, now the thing is that where to, here one thing I'll just say one minute here. If you store on the surface, you can store anywhere. You can store in your pocket also. There was a drama we have played on 22nd of March and say that drama in the drama, it was that somebody has uh, hidden this eight liters of water into the Almira. This was only the message, actually, it cannot be possible. Well, but the time is going to come that the water is going to be more precious. You see, eight liter, eight liter is very small nowadays, but the, the time is going to come that it will be a very big thing. And in the, <laughs> the police came, police has opened all those people. That thing. So that's what I'm telling you that it's important. But subsurface is the best place to, why? Because you can store in the house also. That will be very small account. Because you see your rain comes hardly a few days. Say maximum, I think 30, 30 days or 25 days nowadays. Because earlier it used to be 52 days. Now it has reduced. I have already just explained to you. So you have to, you have to live all 365 days. You cannot say no. I live only for 10 days or 15 days and remaining I'll be sleeping or going hibernated. No, it's not possible. So this is how, so that's why you have to store it, right? So when you store it, and I hear my second point is I store it under the ground because we are in a arid country, uh, 50, more than 50% will be evaporation. I think this is the last slide, my <laughs> So uh, second point. The third point is we have to, that's, that I, this is for you, for you also. Explain the technology and finding into understanding language. I came to know our minister also directly told that you people publish a paper with double and triple integration integral uh, equation, which nobody can understand. I mean, those people. <laughs> so this is time has come now for all scientists also that we should publish our course. We have to publish a with very good paper with the impact factor all things, but then again, we have to make another parallel publication, which is understandable by everybody, with the policy maker, with the politician, with the public also. That so that is then that the last point is that make the groundwater visible is not enough. We have to put the groundwater into the mind of the people. I think this is my last slide. Thank you. Yeah. I request uh, our chairman, Dr. Shankar Kumar Nath, to present the memento and shawl to Dr. Shakil Ahmed. So friends, without uh, losing any more time, I will now invite Professor Sudha Bhaskar, the last speaker of this session. Professor Bhaskar will be speaking on environmental solution for municipal solid waste management using thermal plasma processing. The stage is yours, ma'am. Half an hour. No, it's, uh, it's, I think it will be delayed, just. <laughs> 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 yeah. Like uh, I do. Professor Sudha Braska is an academician of more than half a century now. 
She has been a professor of physics. SP Pune University. She is an emeritus professor at CSIS in New Delhi, worked as much as UGC in New Delhi and for the past two years um, as an interactive scientist. And she is uh, a passionate about the research and has, and has a opening record of 231 publications since around uh, uh, to her credit. And we are really honored to have her here. Uh, and for making a presentation, which is a very important presentation for all of us to, so let us all uh, enjoy her talk. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And I first uh, take an opportunity to thank the organizers of ISA for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk before you. Uh, actually, as it is um, already being uh, taken up, the cleaning the environment is one of the greatest problem and that too in the urban uh, cities, as well as in the rural villages. And now, because the Clean India movement has uh, started, so it is more important that we have to think about the kind of the waste management. Now, I am going to concentrate on the municipal waste management. I will be uh, taking the layout of the lecture to be like uh, introduction of the waste management problems possible solutions and status, then plasma for waste management, and scientific background of plasma, because it is uh, maybe not very much known, and current scenario at Pune University, because I have been working with a group for uh, uh, developing this technology. Now, there are different kinds of waste materials, and for example, the municipal solid waste is one of the very big problem. Then hazardous materials, including PCBs, printer circuit boards, hospitals, uh, solid waste, then incinerator, residues, that is bottom ash and fly ash, because whatever is the burnt material, it again contains the poisonous materials. Then contaminated soil, usually with the hazardous organic materials, then sewage, sludge waste, and other sludge waste, low level radioactive materials, then industrial waste, and manufacturing and constructing materials. Now, these are all the kinds of the waste which we can count as the solid waste. Now, in the solid waste, the municipal solid waste is uh, one of the very big problem for the municipal municipality. As we, uh, any, any corporator will have these difficulties. So today, the treatment of non-biodegradable waste has become one of the central problem in the major cities. Now, biodegradable waste is already known that it can be treated or it can be recycled. So there are different ways, but non-biodegradable waste is a big problem. So traditional methods used for waste management are, first let us see what are these. They are the land dumping, landfills and ocean dump sites. Then incineration, that is burning in air. So in open air, we must have seen that a lot of uh, waste is burnt and um, is used for the removing and converting them into degradable products. First solution that is the land dumping looks to be like this, wherein it will be all uh, filled with dirt. Then the second solution is the landfill. Landfill is also still being used in many places. I have seen them even in the big cities. Now this landfill consists of the clay liner and different linings and there are wells which have been drawn to um, outlet the emission of the methane gases. And, but it requires a large area which has to be selected out of the city. Then the problems with the waste dumps and the landfills are the waste dump is a tickling time bomb and we will see how it is. Waste dump is a source of diseases, groundwater and air pollution as just now we have seen. The groundwater of course uh, gets contaminated because of these problems of landfill. It affects life not only of adjoining population, but also of people far away from it. It is source of greenhouse gas emission due to methane, often a source of fire also. Landfills occupy huge productive land and if exploited properly, it is source of huge business. So that is also one of the problems. Now, you can see this is the 
there are various problems with the solid waste. There are some burning, some animals or cattle are wandering around. It all leads to the dirty spaces. This is one of the photographs of Devnar in uh, Bombay, where uh, in Mumbai, the dumping of MSW at Devnar had uh, led to the continuous fire for 15 days. And it was very difficult to the corporation to uh, put off the fire. And this was only because of the dump uh, site at Devnar, a large amount of dumps. And it is very recent story. So we cannot say that it is a past story. So second solution is the traditional way of di disposing the waste involving burning in open air, that is known as incineration. So this, that was the land dump where automatically methane gas gets emitted and it take, uh, catches fire. But in incineration, it is the deliberate burning and that is produces pollution. You can see how it is going to pollute the air. And this is still a common problem and it has been even used with the rice husk in Punjab, which leads to the lot of pollution in Delhi. So another solution is recycling of some of the selected waste, like uh, waste like selected high density plastics into oil. And uh, second is the wet garbage into com compost or biogases. So it may be aerobic or anaerobic waste management method. However, these require segregation. So that means you have to re separate out the kind of the waste that is collected in the municipal solid waste. Now, this uh, um, is actually one of the problems where the rack pickers uh, segregate them. And society says, some of the social workers, they say that, no, you have to allow the rack pickers because you will be catching out, taking out their jobs. But I don't think that is one of the solutions because this also leads to a lot of uh, bad health problems. So, however, issues still remain, and this is one of the news items in Times of India that how uh, status of garbage processing plants are not running properly. Now, there are every alternate day we see such kind of news in the newspaper. In Pune, it is one of the very big problem to how to tackle the waste uh, management, that is this municipal solid waste. So, thus the problems with the conventional methods are the land fillings are have limitations on account of shortage of space, whereas conventional incinerators often produce air pollution as well as they produce hazardous gases like dioxin and furan. That too with the with COVID-19, we had seen that it was a very, very big problem how to remove the hospital waste. Residues contain hazardous materials. As much as 30% of the processed solid waste remains as ash. So he, this is one of the problems that this does not reduce into zero, but the 30% of the uh, so starting material will remain as a residue. This ash is solid waste and can be hazardous. And some of the waste materials like glass, metal, etc. require additional sources of fuel like petrol or diesel for combustion during the incineration. So they cannot be destroyed or they cannot be burnt in the incineration process. So the best solution that I am proposing or we have been proposing for the last few years is about the thermal plasma waste treatment by gasification is one of the prominent technologies. Now it also produces valuable co-products in this te technique like electricity, petroleum and vitrified slag. And it is capable of treating non-segregated waste. So segregation is one of the big problems. So non-segregated waste, if it is collected and then uh, used in the plasma waste management technique, it is going to work out. And there are different thermal processes, of course. That means I am talking about the plasma technique, which is a thermal process. But suppose other thermal processes are also there, which are named differently. The first is pyrolysis, which is heat treatment in absence of air and the second is combustion technology heat treatment in the presence of air known as mass burn or incineration and then the third gasification technique heat treatment in the presence of limited air. 
So the plasma arc gasification is the technique which I am talking about heat treatment at the high temperature in presence of limited air. So the limited air is one of the advantages and that is known as gasification. So this process is plasma process gasification process for the treatment of principal solid waste is a very high temperature process. The temperature uh, goes to around 4000 to 6000 or one can even control whereby the organics of waste solid that is MSW are converted to a synthesis gas which is known as syngas and the inorganics and the minerals of the waste solid that is MSW produce a rock like byproduct. So approximately the composition of municipal solid waste consists of different degradation like paper is a large quantity, then scrap material, food scrap, plastic, metals, rubber, glass, wood and other materials to different extents. It changes from place to place. Then average value of MSW, now suppose we talk about the calorific value because we have been talking about the heating or gasification. So calorific value is how much heat can be produced by burning the MSW, one can get 22 megajoules per kg that is equivalent to 6 kilowatt, kilowatt hour per kg. Then polyvinyl chloride produces 35 megajoules per kilogram. Then LDP low density polyethylene produces 43 megajoules per kilogram. Medical waste produces 19 and hazardous waste produces around 12 megajoules. One kilowatt hour is one unit of electricity. So if this much of power is available, uh, we can use it for the other purpose. So scientific background of plasma quickly I will go through this. Now because I said that this is a plasma gasification, let us understand what is the meaning of plasma and that to thermal plasma. This plasma means if suppose a solid is converted into liquid, it requires some energy and then liquid is converted into gas by additional of additional energy. But suppose we add some more energy to gas, it will be converted into plasma that consists of electrons, ions as well as neutrals and it is a high energy state and it is also known as the fourth state of matter. And uh, plasma state has got a temperature as we can see here is about 10 raised to 6 and gases and liquid and solids will be compared to that will be having a low energy. Now here again the water if it is converted into, it, it, if you add energy or heat it, it converts into a steam and steam converts into ionized gas. So plasma is the ionized gas which consists, uh, which contains ions, electrons or other molecules are the atoms. So unique properties of plasma is that it can completely dissociate all organic and inorganic matter into their elemental compounds in a closed system. So that is why we have to use it because it dissociates each and every product into electrons, ions and the neutrals. Plasma can be in industrially produced using a plasma torch. And the plasma torch can produce extremely high temperatures like more than 5000 degrees centigrade that can, cannot be otherwise created and except through the nuclear fusion. Here, this constituents of the plasma are the plasma consists of mixture of electrons, ions and neutrals. Then pure gas does not conduct electricity but because of the free electric charges in a plasma it conducts electricity that is how the torch will be running. Basically, there are two kinds of plasmas, thermal plasma and cold plasma. Now here in this uh, talk, I am talking about the uh, thermal plasma. Thermal plasma means which can produce a lot of heat, what I was telling. Where in the other example is cold plasma, the tube lights and the light coming out of the incandescent lamps are all the low pressure plasmas. So cold plasma has atmospheric as well as low pressure plasma, whereas thermal plasma usually is at uh, uh, atmospheric pressure. So these are the common examples of the plasma, lamp as well as lamp and discharge. This is a sun is a beautiful example of the thermal plasma, very high temperature, core of the uh, sun is known to have a very extremely high temperature and laboratory arc can be also the example. This, these are the arcs um, and how they look into, look like if, there, if they have some 
metal particles in that they will be giving rise to the colors like aluminum and iron. Then high, high energy density is one of the criterion for this uh, thermal plasma because it is created at atmospheric pressure and low electron energy that is 1 to 2 electron volt but the 1 electron volt being equal to 11,600 degrees it has got a very high temperature. So although the energy in electron volts is low but it has a high temperature and there are different temperatures and energy scales and uh, in the different in temperatures different processes occur like rotation then vibrations dissociation and then the ionization in the plasma. The plasma has got so many other applications and these are the different applications I have shown here and we have been doing this is the cutting plasma can cut the metals it is used industrially so this plasma which is shown is with the torch then the what is the plasma gasification which is responsible for this uh, kind of the waste management it is the second equation gasification means heating with controlled oxygen gasification converts msw to a usable synthesis gas in plasma gasification the waste input is converted directly into constituents like hydrogen oxygen c and nitrogen and the reactor conditions are controlled so that the elements are converted into syngas syngas consists of carbon monoxide and hydrogen and this is the very important factor the materials that cannot convert it into syngas such as metal glass and rocks concrete are vitrified and one very important property is the last one is that slag is only 1 upon 1 to 50th of the volume of the processed solid waste so this reduces to a almost zero value these are the equations which are very important how the uh, material carbohydrocarbons or organic materials or inorganic in organic materials mainly which contains carbon will be converted into mostly these carbon monoxide hydrogen methane and h2o and other gases and because they are my, many of them are exothermic the reaction produces heat and advantage of the plasma <coughs> gasification is that it is high energy <coughs> density and high temperature in the range of uh, very high temperature allows rapid heating and high reaction transfer rates due to ionized species and produces syngases and single step process in a closed chamber. Now the closed chamber is very important and no polluting gases and no emission. So how it can be done is very important and energy production through through the amount of heat which is available the uh, amount of the as i said already the that calorific value is quite high so these are the municipal solid waste has um, water content and that produces um, additional heat and because of that you will be getting a lot of uh, advantages which corresponds to 20 gigajoules or 5.6 megawatt hour per ton of cellulose. Now international status of the plasma technology for waste management is very important and in UK then in uh, Farringdon, in Canada, Florida, they have um, ga installed the plants. Then in the France, or uh, in, uh, um, you can see that in the last one, I will just speed up. The Plas uh, Plasco Energy Group of Canada burns 75 to 85 tons per day of MSW and produces 5.2 megawatt of electricity. So it produces electricity, that is the very important point. So there are more than 272 operating gasification plants worldwide and there are currently 74 plants under construction worldwide and produce 83 megawatt hour of electricity. 33 gasification plants are located in the United States and currently China is one of the largest uh, the country which has got largest plants. Now this is in Florida, the Enviro plant. Um, uh, and which looks like this. Now the very advantage, uh, the important point is that they can manage 100 to 5,000 ton per day for solid waste 
gasification waste through energy is an environmentally friendly means and for sustainable renewable power then gasification allow msw to be a resource and that can offset the use of fossil fuels for the generation of electricity and most important is 24 by 7 by 365 time it is available so it is a continuous production through the rural as well as urban uh, places and that's why you can say that it is a, a renewable energy now the con continuous energy now these are the energy data for the some of the plants like plasco demo plant and westinghouse and uh, you can see that the output power in the last last column uh, is about the how much power they are generating now, even if the extra power is not generated, if it is uh, <clears throat> the amount of the solid waste is less, it can run the plant and it can produce a clean weather. Now, this Maharashtra Enva Pro Corporation in Ranjangaon near Pune has got this plant, and but this has been uh, installed with the help of uh, GEC company, and there are some problems with that. So PMC has, in Pune, PMC has impo imported incineration plant, not the gasification plant, from Rosham from Germany. And different energy groups use chemical methods to convert the plastic into diesel. Rudra is one of the such kind of uh, investment in Pune. And Mailhem Eco Environment Private Limited, it converts the biodegradable MSW into CNG gas. So they are been doing in different ways but they are not uh, doing the same gasification they are doing either incineration or this is the rudra plant now uh, again the pune the municipal corporation waste to green energy project from processing garbage in hadapsar has run into trouble so because it is again imported plant and it is an incineration plant mumbai waste Rosham separation system private in which has operating plant on the built operate transfer basis to process 700 ton day waste generation and 10 megawatt of electricity has failed to run to its full capacity. So what I want to advocate here is that the plant uh, which looks like this should be indigenously built so that we can operate it properly and that is what I will show what we are doing. Now this is the schematic of the plant which looks like this. The first part is where we feed, we feed the uh, waste and there are two torches and the outlet in the bottom is the slag which is can be vitrified slag and which can be used for the road construction output from the upper part is the syngas and which can convert water into heat and heat and the steam and that steam is used in the steam turbine as well as the gas when it is purified it will be converted into pure uh, gases uh, by the a scrubber and then the uh, if it is not heat is not extracted the gas itself hydrogen and carbon monoxide can be combusted and you can again run the gas turbine and finally one can get the electricity so the plasma produces high temperature environmental in gasification and large molecules such as plastic are completely broken so hazardous dioxin and furans are inhibited because of a temperature window which prohibits them so these are the different a comparison of these two I will not mm, go into detail this is plasma incineration and the gasification so what we say is gasification is always better than the incineration because it produces higher temperature and plasma in gasification produces high temperature and gasification means the less amount of oxygen so that carbon is converted into carbon monoxide so this is the comparison of various uh, plants like uh, First is the um, the 816 uh, amount of M MSW which is converted into energy. So you can see that the uh, incinerator produces 544, wherein the arc gasification in the top one produces 816. Uh, this is mega um, watt of uh, energy. So this is the advantage that whatever we will be burning, we will be converting into electricity. So the plasma technology developed in our university he has been uh, um, actually developed by in Department of Physics. And for last 20 years, we have strong collaboration with BRC Mumbai Plasma Division. And we have successfully completed a number of plasma, plasma projects with them and have trained around 15 PhD students in this. 
Uh, now, these are the plants. This is our uh, plasma uh, unit in our laboratory. We use it for generating nanoparticles. So we are doing some material science research. Then this is again another uh, plasma chamber. This is inside the lab. And this is again the another um, chamber. We have different uh, plasma uh, reactors in the laboratory. And we are doing research with the different kinds of metals, metal oxides, semiconductors, and other materials. And there is a torch which is loaded at the top, which is installed at the top, which can be moved up and down. And this is again, the, there are double torch systems. This is a torch which is important, which we uh, are going to operate. And this is a torch which is run by air. So air will be introduced, plus the, the torch consists of a cathode and anode, and it will be transferred to the, the flame will be going into the uh, dust or the, the, the waste, and it will be burning. So this is how we can see that the plasma has got this intense heat and which can melt the metals, melting of the copper and these different metals are seen here. And this is the burning of metal, burning of paper. <coughs> so what we have observed is that we can burn it within, uh, within two minutes, we, it will be completely vanished, some 10 kgs of the MSW, different amount of polymers or paper or any kind of the waste will be introduced into that. And these are different burning uh, products. Now, this is the chamber which we have right now um, installed for uh, plasma waste management using uh, the gasification. Those in this chamber, one can see the kind of the flame and which when it is operated. Now, the, this is measurement of the NOx, that is uh, uh, not completely oxidized nitrogen oxide, which is very hazardous. So there is a regulatory limit and we have measured that whatever gases, toxic gases are just emitted, they are just below the regulatory norms and they will be completely pur purified by the uh, scrubber, that is the catalytic as well as the scrubbing action. And these are the Bharat regulatory norms for concentration of in, in PPM levels for these gases. So our plant is a high, which is capable of this is a pilot plant and we are running for 100 kg of municipal solid waste and uh, we have uh, used the torch uh, the technology developed by BRC Mumbai and we use, we are installing 30 kilowatt uh, input power for the torch and the pollution norms set by the government of India will be followed and it will be below the 200 ppm. So yes, I will. I'll wind up. So the scaling up of the uh, plant will increase its efficiency for power production. So that is what we are going to do. This is the layout that, uh, again, whatever I had already explained, ignition, this, these are the layout. And this is the schematic diagram of our plant. And this is, yeah, this is the, finally, the plant, which looks like this with my students and myself. So I thank you for your patience. I request Dr. Harsha Merchant, Principal, Aishabai College of Education, Mumbai, to present the memento and shawl to our plenary speaker, Dr. Sudha Boraskar, retired professor, Department of Physics, SP Pune University. Thank you. 
<laughs> Huge applause, please. Uh, friends, you all will agree that uh, this uh, second plenary of today was very uh, uh, fruitful, provocative also. I could see that people want to talk too much, but I'm sorry because of constant of time, we are not in a position to uh, uh, allow this. Uh, let me thank uh, the chair for agreeing to... Uh, coordinate and conduct this session very efficiently, effectively. Let me, may I also propose the vote of thanks to uh, Professor Boraskar for his brilliant presentation, Professor Sudha Boraskar and Professor Vien Boraskar, and also uh, Dr. Sakil Ahmad Khan, who has brilliantly presented uh, uh, the, his presentation was really very good on groundwater. We, we feel it. Uh, wiser after listening him. Thank you all for having the patience uh, to be with us uh, uh, in this after even uh, the lunch was ready and the message, was, message is coming up. Now we are breaking here for lunch and we will be uh, going to a different parallel sessions. And by five we have a public lecture by uh, P. Shainath. He will be here, so we all are invited and requested to be there positively before 5 so that we can enjoy that uh, session. There is another, uh, um, another public lecture person also in that same session. So we have two public lectures in fact. Just a minute. Yeah, the other one is... Uh, uh, Kambadur Murlidhar. So these two persons will be there for uh, public lecture. But Shayad, uh, perhaps uh, Murlidhar is not here, so it will be only P. Sainath for this public lecture. Yeah. Uh, Srinivas. Srinivas tomorrow, na? Today. So he has been replaced by Srinivas then. Yeah. So let us uh, go for lunch. Uh, we have our publications on the ground floor uh, at the auditorium. Please visit us and then uh, see the latest uh, digital feature, human feature in digital era, the latest publication that came in the inaugural session that is also there. We have 50% discount. Thank you. 